Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amanda, and I welcome you all to Flipkart Inspired. It's wonderful to have you all with us today. I'm your host, but I also have my colleagues Ishmeet and Chaitra on standby in case I drop off. When we set out to create Inspired, our objective was to bring together this wonderful community of women in the space of technology. Today is the third edition of this curated series of events by Flipkart. Over the first two editions of Inspired, we brought in leaders from Flipkart to talk about some of the most exciting work that we have done in the space of technology. And today will be no different, except that we are doing this virtually for the first time. Over the next three hours, we will have leaders from Flipkart taking center screen to showcase some of the pioneering work that we are doing. They'll also be sharing their insights as well as answering some of your questions. But that's not all. We also have an exciting activity for you in between the sessions where you stand a chance to win some exciting prizes. So stay tuned and glued to your screens. In order to save all of our bandwidth for our speakers for today, we have disabled the audio, video, and chat feature for all participants. But the Q&A tab is open throughout the session. So feel free to post as many questions as you like, and we'd be happy to answer them. To start things off, I would like to invite a very special lady who joins us all the way from the US, the vibrant and charismatic Dawn Patak, Vice President and Group Controller, who leads our accounting and control teams with her positive spirit and compassion. Dawn, over to you to flag off the events for today. Wonderful. Thank you, Amanda. Welcome, everyone. We're so excited to have you today. Um, I'm just going to get my presentation up real quick. Wonderful. Again, welcome. Um, I'm so very honored and excited to be here with all of you today. And I want to congratulate you. Actually, you're all investing in yourself, owning your development in your career, and stepping out to learn some new areas and benchmark industry trends. So we're so excited and glad to have you join us today. This forum um, aims not only to give you a peek into the trailblazing work that Flipkart is doing in our tech domain, but to also shine a light on you. You're the women in technology, the disruptors. You're driving innovation forward. And Flipkart is proud to champion the role that women like you play in pursuit of technology advancement. You know, um, apart from social, um, cultural context, technology firms sometimes allow systemic biases to creep in. And that has deterred women, um, sometimes away from these type of fields. Things such as perceptions of technology um, needing to have extremely long hours, inflexible, um, and really just not creating a more flexible and inclusive environment for women. NASA was one of the examples I thought of to share with you today. Um, and it was really an example of when the women astronauts were denied to spacewalk. It's one of the very public examples of what systemic biases can do to further deepen inequalities. You know, the, the suits, the, the space suits were, not, were only built for men. They weren't, were never built believing that women would go into space. And it just shows a good example of a systemic bias. Now at Flipkart, our endeavor is to ensure that women represent and experience a level playing field. We wanna ensure our environment is free from pressures to play by the rules dictated by another gender. And that, we, Everyone has the visibility to successful role models, women role models that have grown to senior leadership positions. We firmly believe that creating a workplace where everyone is free to bring their true selves to work every day is the heart of leadership and innovation. 
I'm so proud not only to be um, a woman, but also to be in a leadership position for a company like Flipkart, where you are really treated equal and you can continue to aspire and grow. I wanted to share with you a little bit of some of our innovation um, in the tech area that we've launched recently. So last year, Flipkart had created a Hindi language platform around Big Billion Days, um, our big sale event for the year. And what we realized was as internet penetration reaches Burart, the challenge facing brands in different companies were how do you effectively capture the next tier of markets? How do you capture those tier two, tier three, tier four markets? and really serve the next 200 million internet users in India. So there was an explosion of digital content in various Indian languages and Flipkart knew that would be an important capability to reach our next group of internet users. Another example is that um, Flipkart has forayed into offering original video content when we launched our Flipkart video originals. It was integrated um, with our Flipkart video platform. The content is produced by some of the best creators in the industry and curated especially for the Flipkart platform. Flipkart has worked with industry talent production houses to bring forth first of its kind content across gen genres and languages. And our focus at Flipkart has been to bring this value to the lives of our customers. And then the last example is a very recent, just a couple of days ago example I wanted to share, which is Flipkart's voice assistant. We launched a, a new voice assistant available for our grocery store, Supermart, to enable consumers to buy products easily using voice commands in multiple languages, starting with Hindi and English. Our homegrown e-commerce company has been at the forefront of building India First Innovations. This voice first conversational AI platform has been built in house by our technology team with solutions for speech recognition, natural language understanding, machine translation, text to speak for Indian languages. The AI platform is built to automatically detect the language spoken by users and in real time transcribe, translate, transliterate, and understand the user's intent to have engaging shopping experience. The consumer behavior changes, especially during our current environment with COVID-19, is leading um, in tech and bringing e-commerce companies that are providing solutions to customers into an in, even more important space. So we at Flipkart are ensuring we're building trust and reliability with our customers in an approach that is customer first, but tech enabled. These are just a few of many examples I wanted to share with you today. Obviously, today's session is going to bring you outstanding other examples of the um, very innovative areas of our tech organization. And um, before I wrap up my introduction, I really wanted to leave you with a quote. Um, this came from the co-founder of Girl Develop It, Vanessa Hurst, and it says, feeling a little uncomfortable with your skills is a sign of and continuous learning is what tech industry thrives on. It's important to seek out environments where you are supported, but where you have a chance to be uncomfortable and learn new things. Um, this is really important. When I look at my career, some of my most significant growth experiences has been when I have felt the most uncomfortable. Um, and coming from a very diverse background, spending time in different cultures um, and different industries and different projects, you know, when you feel that uncomfortableness is when you're actually growing. And so um, I really hope you enjoy this session today. Please stay present, stay engaged, make this event yours. We want to support in your development and exposure. You're going to hear from some of our outstanding senior engineer leaders at Flipkart on some of the key innovations and features we're working on. And I am so proud to be a woman, le woman leader working for such an innovative tech company that can really make a difference for Pan India. So thank you again, um, really excited to have you and I hope you really embrace and enjoy this session today. Amanda, back over to you.
Thank you so much, Dawn. It was really lovely to have you with us today. Moving on, I hope you guys are ready for a sneak peek into the world of technological innovations that take place at Flipkart. Very virtually welcoming our first speaker for today, Manasvi Sharma. Manasvi has over 17 years of rich and diverse experience of building consumer and enterprise technology solutions across high energy startups, large corporations, and his own entrepreneurial ventures. He currently leads product and engineering for Marketplace at Flipkart. Manasvi, over to you. Thank you, Amanda. And uh, thank you so much, uh, all of you, for joining uh, this session. I know it's the uh, you know, most active session for the, you know, active hour for the week, uh, 3 p.m. Saturday, I know. Uh, so, uh, you know, we'll try to make it as interesting as possible. And um, let me uh, just open my presentation. <clears throat> the reason, uh, you know, we are talking about uh, this, uh, uh, you know, this, this specific topic is uh, when we really booted up, uh, booted it up in, uh, uh, in in marketplaces in Flipkart, uh, we realized how little uh, information is available, uh, you know, across the internet on this, right? And how important uh, it is, uh, you know, to the entire ecosystem. I think, uh, uh, you know, a huge part of uh, the experiences that uh, you know people go through, uh, you know, the wow that is created on e-commerce platforms you know, the next best selection that is coming to you um, is really hinged upon, you know, how good, uh, you know, your sellers are on the platform, right? And I think uh, to make, uh, you know, those sellers as good as they are, uh, this is what, uh, you know, powers them. This is the intelligence that powers them. Right? And <clears throat> online selling is, uh, you know, growing and growing at a rapid pace. Uh, we were, you know, looking at uh, data in around Feb, and uh, you know the number of people who want to sell online has more than doubled, and this is just the pre-COVID number. Um, and my apologies, I was not able to you know get the post-COVID numbers, uh, but I'm sure that you know the interest in online selling uh, through any anecdotal uh, you know channel, I, I think it has just uh, probably quadrupled now. Right? Uh, <clears throat> but one thing that uh, a lot of people don't realize is how uh, complex the seller platform relationship is, right? Um, and let me let me just uh, try to um, you know <clears throat> qualitatively try to explain that, right? Uh, for a consumer, uh, if he is buying uh, you know three things from your platform, uh, and tomorrow he buys fifty things from your platform, you are happy, right? Everyone is happy. Uh, you don't bother about, you know, where is he going to keep, uh, you know, those, uh, you know, those items and, you know, uh, do they, do they really want it and so on and so forth. You're just happy that the sale happened, right? Uh, but flip over to the seller side. And if your seller is getting five orders a day and, you know, suddenly he gets 50 orders a day or they get 50 orders a day, uh, you know, you really have a serious problem. Uh, you will have to think that whether they'll be able to fulfill those orders. Do they have the capital? Uh, do they have the you know uh, um, you know the number of uh, people to pick and pack and uh, you know do stuff with that order? Right? Those, those those many number of orders. So, uh, <clears throat> seller growth is not a straightforward, uh, or, or you know the entire ecosystem is not a very straightforward ecosystem, right? Uh, there are, uh, you know, both uh, Flipkart and their sellers, uh, its, its sellers, they share uh, this common aspiration that, you know, uh, we have to grow and we have to grow in our business. Uh, but they also want uh, more and more out of each other, right? And, um, you know, uh, there, is, uh, there is an overall convergence uh, in the goals, but there is also, you know, very healthy push and pull uh, into making that ecosystem, entire ecosystem, very, very vibrant, right? <clears throat> and uh, just this was a way to give you a flavor as to, uh, you know, why uh, concepts around, uh, you know, working capital, concepts around inventory, concepts around, you know, manpower, potential, um, you know, behavioral aspects around sellers, all these uh, things are very, very uh, important in this ecosystem. And they have long-term ramifications of how successful, uh, you know, the sellers would be or, uh, you know, the platform would be, right? 
<clears throat> so, what we noticed is that uh, uh, Is it clear now? Yes, perfect. Got it. So, <clears throat> uh, was I audible for the last uh, minute or so? I think you'll just need to repeat once again. Sure. So, uh, when we have looked at uh, the seller's, uh, you know, journey, uh, you know, when they onboard the platform and, uh, you know, a few days from then, uh, there is a drastic uh, decrease in the enthusiasm, right? And, uh, and, and that's a very honest data, right? Uh, day one, they feel that, um, uh, you know, uh, this is the next best thing after sliced bread. And uh, day 10, they suddenly realize that, you know, uh, the growth that they expected uh, isn't happening on the platform, right? In fact, 20% uh, plus sellers actually become detractors because, um, you know, they feel that, uh, the, uh, you know, the growth they, that they were expecting isn't happening, right? And uh, it's not a very simple equation when you look at growth, right? So uh, you have to view growth into uh, what uh, the ambition is and, you know, what the potential is, right? I, and that's probably true in, in, in a lot many spheres in life. Right? Uh, a lot of sellers have an ambition to grow maybe at a 200%, 300% clip. Uh, but they do not have the right resources. They do not have the capital. They do not have the understanding of the platform, right? And these are typically a lot of small sellers that are out there, right? And that's where, uh, you know, the mismatch happens. Right? Uh, there's another set of sellers who have immense potential to grow. They have large businesses, sprawling businesses offline, right? Uh, they don't do too well online, right? And uh, sometimes their aspirations online are also not that high, right? Uh, so in both the cases, I think it's uh, it, it becomes uh, imperative for the platform uh, to convey why and how uh, you know that growth can happen for them, right? Uh, and that's where <clears throat> you know that's that's where the secret sauce comes, and which is insights and recommendations, right? What are the business insights? What are the insights from the online world that we can give to the sellers? Right? Uh, how well we can uh, report the impact uh, so that the sellers realize that what they are doing, they are doing well. And, uh, you know, it is actually affecting their business, right? And in a, in a very, very positive way. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> this has seen tremendous results. This has seen tremendous results from, you know, sellers growing on the platform, the platform itself growing and bringing immense value to the consumers and consumers, right? Um, I will now take you uh, to <clears throat> what we actually do, uh, you know, to, to uh, you know, generate all these insights and, you know, uh, how sellers actually make use of them. So, <clears throat> so when we started looking at, uh, uh, you know, the charter overall and, you know, growth as a problem, uh, we realized that uh, growth is uh, hinged upon three very fundamental engines, right? Uh, increasing the customer base, uh, having more satisfied customers, and having reliable and predictable behavior. And we thought that if we do something in each of these, uh, uh, for each of these engines, to boost each of these three engines, uh, we would do well. And hence, uh, <clears throat> we started digging into our data and, you know, try to figure out what are the key insights, uh, key recommendations that we can give to the sellers. Right? So <clears throat> when we think of increasing customer base, there are a lot of customers who um, would want diversity of selection on the platform. right? And, uh, you know, uh, these insights, the selection insights, uh, come from various sources, right? So for example, there may be a competitive a competition of ours who's carrying certain selection, which is not available uh, at our, uh, you know, platform. Right? 
or there may be people who are searching for something right and it's just not available uh, and those are the kind of insights that we try to capture uh, on a very regular basis and activate seller clusters and give them insight as to what selection they want to carry right what are the listings what are the products they should put on the platform and which will sell right uh, and 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 these uh, you know go in uh, from bringing in basic uh, you know products and listings uh, to you know even picking up on trends right uh, so <clears throat> for example uh, you know i searched hard uh, the other day but that there are very few covid themed t-shirts out there i'm sure that that will be a trend once we start going out of uh the next bit uh, to increase uh, the customer base uh, would be around advertising recos right so <clears throat> again um, one of the make a, make or break principles and it's very offline uh, you know comes from a very offline world also is how well you are able to showcase your products how well they are discovered on the e-commerce uh, platform right so what comes on flipkart's first page or second page is uh, sells uh, you know much more than what comes on the third page or fourth page from a discovery perspective when you search what do you get right and one of the ways in which you can boot up and sellers could boot up uh, you know new products or products which they feel that uh, would provide immense value to the consumers uh but somehow uh, they are not figuring uh, up in the discovery because their sales are low or uh, you know people are possibly not searching uh, you know with the right keywords and you know that's uh, maybe there is a new category that they have introduced that's where advertising recos come right and you would have seen when you you would have shopped on you know flipkart and you know uh, other platforms uh you know there are these ad uh, you know ads that come which are you know product ads on the product listing page right and <clears throat> that's the other set of recos that we give to increase the customer base because customers are looking for those products right uh then another thing and um, uh, you know <clears throat> this is an interesting uh, area that uh before we were uh, you know bubbling up uh, stock uh, recommendations and stock recommendations are nothing but uh you know when you figure out uh, that these things are out of stock right or um, you know the stocks are depleting or you know uh, the stocks are selling faster than uh, you know you are able to uh, you know replace them into the uh, system right and we realized that at least 70% sellers were out of stock or would have lost some sales because of out of stock issues right it was mind boggling for us when we uh, actually dig into that data and that's where these uh, recommendations uh, play a massive massive role in safeguarding uh, sales and consistent sales for our sellers <clears throat> and uh, and the last is uh, around conversion right so uh, you know how much of the views the you know their products got and you know how much of the sale happened right i think uh, it's it's important to understand what and why uh, those conversions happen and what are the products which are bringing them higher conversion right similarly uh, <clears throat> i'll move on to the next uh, bit which is around having more satisfied customers now one of the key things that uh, customers look at is uh, having the right price for the product right and pricing is probably one of the most uh, you know deeply invested areas in 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 this entire chart right um we run more than 15 models uh, just around pricing right uh, these models range from uh, you know how do you get a buy now button to models around um, you know uh, some some very interesting models in fact last week uh, we launched a, a new model around uh, intra vertical insights which is to say that you know if you are buying a toy and there are four other toys that the consumer uh, you know browse uh, but eventually bought something else uh, and if it is if, if it can be attributed to price we will give you that pricing insight and which is on similar products uh, so to speak right so uh, very very interesting models around pricing uh, around historical data you know what price gets you the best conversion and things like that um so an area which is very actively invested in and very actively uh, <clears throat> you know looked into it is also important uh, that 
uh, to to understand that uh, pricing recommendations uh, not only cover lowering of prices it actually also covers uh, you know increasing the prices uh, so sometimes sellers can uh, extract more profitability from what they're selling right and i think uh, <clears throat> that's one of the areas that uh, we deeply focus in you know making sure that our sellers are getting the right prices and uh, you know uh, nothing uh, more or nothing less i think that's how we look at it um, <clears throat> we also give them uh, you know deep insights into uh, product quality and uh, you know returns uh, to help them understand that uh, you know what when uh, customers are buying something what are they looking at uh if there are any quality issues uh you know how they can uh, fix them if there are returns what are the reasons for those returns right? is it quality is it uh you know something else is it speed is it uh you know bad packaging right? so i think uh, those are the those those are some of the insights which uh, considerably change uh you know this uh, the the return uh, rates for uh, the sellers and they are able to profit Uh, a lot more because returns is a substantial cost on the sellers right. and the last uh, bucket for this uh, you know growth engine is uh, how reliable and predictable the sellers are right and that uh, that really uh, gets into a couple of constructs right couple of constructs is um, is the promise speed uh, you know uh, delivered to the uh, uh, you know consumer right uh is the seller dispatching things uh, later than the promise date right or even the dispatches late and we do penalize the sellers on on that one right? uh, <clears throat> or and, and give them insights into it right how they can improve their you know dispatch rates uh there may be delays in you know transits so you know how do the sellers deploy their inventory uh which warehouses they want to keep their inventory it should be closest to where uh, you know uh, the maximum sales for their products are coming from right? uh, so that the speed is a good equation right? and uh, this is how we round off uh, you know the reliability and the predictability part of uh, the entire equation and um, <clears throat> but having said that i think uh, there are um, there are three very fundamental um you know baseline guardrails that we take uh, when we give insights and recommendations right we would never compromise on uh, the consumer experience the consumer experience should be best in class right? so for example if we feel that uh, you know a bed sheet with a certain thread count should be shipped at this price point we would want to have that quality from the sellers right? the second that we don't want to do is uh compromise on seller profitability uh pricing you know pricing recommendations are a classic example uh <clears throat> that if you, if you go below a certain price the profitability suffers right and we don't want an unhealthy ecosystem so seller profitability uh, and maximizing that seller profitability with the right pricing construct is another important target for us and the third thing uh is sustainable working capital and uh, the first example that i gave um, uh, is around uh, you know five orders and 50 orders what is the capability of a seller right? uh, are they really ready to um, you know invest that much amount of money uh, and uh, you know a healthy working capital ratio is something that we really really uh, you know care about our sellers we don't want our sellers to go bankrupt right or take loans that they cannot repay so i think uh, those are the three uh, major uh, you know guardrails uh, for these growth engines <clears throat> i will now segue into uh, uh, you know how we actually uh, deliver these um, uh, you know recommendations how how the systems are built for these right because this is to be done at a massive scale uh, every day for millions and millions of listings and millions and millions of uh, you know recommendations are generated around them so i'll i'll just give you a sneak peek into uh, what we do uh, from a technology platform perspective to uh, you know build these and uh, churn out these reports so on a on a on a everyday basis uh, we actually ingest signals 
uh, which range from sales and conversions and listing signals to competition signals to stock signals and many, many other signals. And uh, these signals are, you know, going to millions every day we ingest. Uh, these signals are also real time as well as, uh, you know, uh, offline signals. Offline signals come from uh, something what we call as a flip card data platform. And this, this is primarily historical data. And, uh, you know, real uh, uh, live signals come, uh, you know, uh, to us through Kafka streams into our primary ingestion uh, systems, right? And what these primary ingestion systems do is that they try to aggregate uh, the data, uh, enrich the data, and bring out certain bits of, uh, uh, or, or, or pieces of primary, uh, you know, insights, right? And those primary insights at a, are at a certain granularity on which we work further, right? So the next uh, level that we go to is actually the meat of this entire system, right? Where we actually execute uh, the models. Uh, and these models are, uh, you know, as I uh, mentioned on the pricing uh, side, you know, there are 15 plus models that we compute every day, right? Uh, these models are computed and uh, the insights are generated. Now, <clears throat> There's a part of, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, this question would be, uh, uh, you know, uh, echoing in a lot of people's minds that, you know, there may be uh, recommendations which are contrary to each other. There are conflicts, right? Uh, how do you rank uh, and prioritize, right? So uh, we do apply, uh, you know, certain ranking and prioritization uh, rules uh, and models around the insights that are generated. And then they are assigned, uh, you know, the requisite uh, product tags, and uh, you know, fed into our system. Uh, <clears throat> post that, uh, we also apply, uh, as I said, uh, conflict uh, resolution uh, rules. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, increasing sales may uh, throw a minus five uh, rupees, uh, you know, insight uh, from a pricing perspective. But maximizing profit or, uh, you know, the right pricing algorithm may say, you know, it's a plus 10, right? And we have to figure out what is the right recommendation for that, uh, you know, uh, product or that listing that goes out to the consumer. Right? Uh, finally, uh, all these insights uh, after their conflict resolution, ranking and prioritization, uh, they are fed into uh, our, uh, you know, data platform systems. They are also fed into uh, the layer from which we will be able to serve our customers, right? And because these serving layers are, uh, you know, are, you need to have a very high volume traction, uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's the reason that, uh, you know, they, they are also fed into a real-time system. <clears throat> uh, from the real-time systems, uh, and this is, uh, you know, your uh, classic Elasticsearch clusters that we use, uh, we, superimpose uh, certain seller uh, attributes, right? And those seller attributes range from uh, who the seller is, right? And that understanding is very important for us. Uh, so the insights that we give to, uh, you know, a manufacturer would be different from a trader to a reseller, to someone who owns uh, a private label. So, uh, you know, giving an insight that, uh, sell a Neil Kamal plastic chair uh, to Urban Ladder as a seller, uh, even though it may increase his, uh, you know, in increase their sales is, is, is not a bright idea. Right? So there is a level of personalization that we have to go through. Right? The personalization also happens uh, at the adoption propensity of the sellers, right? How much, uh, how much, uh, you know, how much are they, uh, open to adopting insights, right? And there are actually uh, different degrees to which sellers are, uh, you know, attuned to picking up those insights and recommendations, right? And I'll come to those reasons, uh, and, and those are probably uh, some of the biggest challenges that we'll have to solve um, for this charter. Right? And finally, I think uh, all the touch points that we have with our sellers, we deliver these insights. Uh, which is, uh, you know, on their dashboards, uh, through, uh, you know, their account managers, uh, <clears throat> through seller support, and, uh, you know, our mobile apps, etc. And finally, uh, 
we also uh, report uh, some very deep statistics as to you know what is the ROI that they uh, got from uh, uh, you know adopting these insights, right? Uh, because that's what uh, you know matters to the sellers. They they're understanding that if I did something, uh, what did it amount to, right? Uh, what did I earn extra? Did I actually grow? Uh, so that's a brief of what we do on the Seller Insights platform. Uh, this is uh, the tech stack uh, that we use. Uh, we use uh, uh, you know the Kafka systems, Kafka Stream, especially uh, heavily to get the real time insights. Um, Spark is used to run our models. Uh, Elasticsearch uh, is used to you know bubble up our uh, you know insights to the end consumers. HBase is where we store, uh, you know, a lot of our data uh, as as the final insights, as well as uh, you know intermediate insights. And Java Vertex is obviously, um, you know, your uh, you know way to do uh, your application logic. Right? So that's how uh, we do. And we uh, occasionally, uh, uh, you know, uh, use uh, Druid also to uh, do quick experimentation and also uh, <clears throat> you know do certain querying on. Our systems, right? so uh, uh, more on the experimentation side. So I think that's the technology side. And this is some, uh, you know, uh, these are these are some of the ways in which we are, uh, you know, delivering uh, insights, right? So there are, uh, as you can see, you know, there are pricing recommendations, pricing suggestions for in-demand products, right? So what is selling, and we are giving pricing recommendations on that. What is dormant, we are giving pricing recommendations on that, right? Uh, there are stock recommendations that you can see. There are uh, insights based on sale conversions that you can see, right? So <clears throat> there's a sneak peek there. Uh, this is how, uh, you know, pricing recommendations actually look. Uh, and these are the nudges that we give, and this is a you know uh, peer view of uh, you know how other sellers in that cohort have done. Right? Um, and as you can see, uh, there is a staggering uh, you know statistic here that uh, uh, their average sales uh, grew by 102 percent, right? And that's a massive number uh, to look at. Right? <clears throat> Uh, the sellers are able to also action upon the insights that are out there, mostly, uh, you know, from wherever they are and wherever they, uh, you know, see the insights, they are able to also action and consume those insights uh, from that place. Let me also uh, come to some interesting numbers. Uh, the platform that we have made uh, for uh, insights uh, and recommendations gives us immense uh, you know uh, leverage uh, around agility right we are able to roll out uh, models experiment with models at a extremely uh, you know quick uh, pace in fact uh, uh, when we opened up for uh, you know post uh, covid right which was a few weeks away uh, we were able to uh, you know provide our sellers with valuable uh, you know selection and pricing insights vis-a-vis uh, -vis the change landscape uh, on, on, on COVID. Uh, and, um, you know, we were able to launch this kind of a model within 24 hours. Right? And that's, that's astounding for, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure some of you would be doing this, uh, uh, you know, in your day jobs, and you would realize uh, that, you know, this is a phenomenal agility uh, as far as rolling out models is concerned. Uh, <clears throat> There are uh, a good 50% uh, uh, of the sellers uh, who are, uh, you know, covered uh, under various insights as, uh, you know, uh, from from their inception, right? I think within within three months of their inception. Right? Um, we launch uh, uh, probably, uh, you know, every two weeks we launch a new pricing model, um, and that's the agility that you know this kind of a tech platform provides us. Right? Uh, we ingest around 140 million uh, plus uh, events every week. And again, I'm sure that, you know, uh, this data would have grown uh, in the last, uh, you know, month or two. Uh, we generate, uh, you know, more than 1.6 million recommendations. And just, a, you know, a, a, a geeky statistic out here that, uh, you know, at any given point in time, we use at least 550 GB of Spark memory in our clusters, right? 
coming to uh, uh, you know the business side of it, uh, there is uh, you know the listings where our insights are adopted. They see an uptick, an average uptick of sixty percent or more. Uh, 75% of the sellers who have adopted uh, into some of the recommendations uh, on the platform uh, have seen, uh, you know, um, superlative growth. And 45% of the sellers are, you know, actively repeat, uh, you know, uh, repeat adoption of our listings, uh, of our recommendations on the platform. Right? So some interesting statistics out there. And uh, just to show <clears throat> Uh, that how important, uh, you know, this charter becomes from, uh, you know, the entire ecosystem. Uh, lastly, uh, I would come to, you know, the kind of challenges that we face uh, while churning out, uh, you know, the insights and recommendations. So one definitely, uh, and which probably I haven't uh, noted down here is, uh, the growing scale, right? The more, uh, uh, you know, the more signals we want to consume. And as I said uh, uh, in, in, in the first part of uh, the conversation that uh, seller and platform ecosystem is a very, very complicated ecosystem. And hence the amount of signals that we consume uh, to give out an insight, um, you know, is, is huge, right? And adding any dimension, any new dimension into that uh, equation, uh, means that our tech systems have to scale up and scale up seamlessly. Right? So uh, tech scaling up is definitely a challenge. The second is uh, the trust and recommendations. Right? And uh, unlike uh, the consumer world where, uh, you know, if you are shown, uh, you know, recommended for you, you know, if you are shown a t-shirt or a shoe, and if you buy that, uh, you know, probably, uh, uh, you know, and if the consumer is not happy, they will just return the uh, you know T-shirt and be happy about it. Right? Uh, in the seller world, uh, it doesn't work like that, right? Uh, if a seller loses money, uh, it's not good for him. It's not good for you because they lose trust in the recommendations, right? And uh, uh, they uh, they don't want to uh, you know do business with you, right? So. It's very important uh, that our confidence levels in uh, you know the recommendations that we give is established, and that's where uh, uh, you know a lot of we we try to bring a lot of transparency uh, into our insights, into our recommendations, and we also try to figure out in a very very objective way what has been the uh, ROI for the seller. Right? The second part is. Uh, the amount of touch points that a seller has, right? And uh, uh, typically, uh, you know, slightly larger sellers are not individuals. Uh, they are companies, uh, they have staff. And hence, uh, the people uh, who uh, are in charge of, the, uh, of, of, of taking decisions, right? May or may not have the view into, uh, you know, the recommendations that the platform is given. Uh, so you have to make and work through the discovery of these insights and recommendations in a way that people who have to decide on them, right, uh, see those recommendations and see those recommendations in a meaningful way, actionable way. Right? Uh, so that's another problem that is uh, very complicated to be solved on the, uh, you know, uh, due, due to the complexity of the seller world. Right? There are insights, uh, there are recommendations that you would want to give. Uh, but there are constraints with the seller, right? Uh, they may not have uh, the right working capital. They may be working on very, very low margins, right? Uh, they may not have the labor to fulfill uh, those many number of orders, right? So uh, that's again a hindrance towards uh, accepting and adopting uh, the recommendations that the platform gives. And lastly, uh, they need to understand the ROI very, very well. And I have, I think, spoken uh, about the ROI equation uh, all through the presentation. Uh, but uh, that's that's one of the key things uh, or, or key drivers for, uh, you know, adopting uh, insights and recommendations. How do we look at it uh, in the future, right? Um, if you think about it, uh, this charter a little holistically, um, we are trying to make, uh, businesses, uh, the money that businesses put uh, onto the platform work better for them, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, create more wealth for them, right? And I think that's, um, that's how 
integrated we would want to think of uh, you know uh, about all the touch points that we have with the seller how they do business with us and give a very very integrated approach uh, to uh, the insights and recommendations and make their money work better for them um very very close to how um you know good bankers will do and uh, we would want to be the good bankers for our sellers right um so that's uh, that's all uh, i wanted to cover i think uh, and that's perfectly uh, probably uh, on, on time and i would leave uh, the you know uh, forum open for questions so amanda back to you uh any questions thank you so much uh, manas for <laughs> sharing those wonderful insights with us we do have a couple of questions that have come in for you so the first one is what are the tech stack being used in flipkart seller ecosystem uh tech stack is being that... used yeah what is the tech stack being used in flipkart seller ecosystem got it so uh, i did show a slide uh, for the tech stack i think uh, you know uh, we use uh, kafka heavily kafka as a messaging platform as well as kafka streams uh, we use hbase very heavily uh, we use spark heavily um, core uh, from a language proposition core we use java and um, you know uh, different teams actually uh, use different flavors of you know how they want to model their application codes uh you know some are uh, into the reactive space uh, using vertex etc uh we also use uh, you know um uh, druid and hive and um, uh, you know yeah i i think broadly that uh, kind of covers the uh, you know tech stack um, yeah but but in in in, in flipkart honestly speaking i think um, uh, developers do make these choices uh, of what tech stacks they use uh and uh, we are uh, you know very open in uh, you know uh, in in fact encouraging the culture where uh, you know people use the big best technology stacks for uh, uh, you know the problems that they're trying to solve and what is suitable for it thank you next one is uh, how does it differ from seller point of view to list on mintra and flipkart say the fashion category as it falls under the same umbrella so i think uh, uh, the value propositions uh, uh, see listing uh, as a technology constraint uh, as as a technology construct or uh, you know the way uh, we do business i think they may have uh, slight differences in in terms of you know ease of listings or you know how do we put up our catalogs and i uh, brilliantly i think uh, the next session is about uh, you know listings with uh, you know deepthi and sumit Uh, so they can give uh, a little more insight on it uh, but from a value proposition perspective i think um, we differ from mintra in in many many ways right and i think uh, uh mintra uh, uh you know how should i put right uh, mintra becomes very very aspirational right if i have to get the best brands uh, you know we we look at mintra and uh, you know we want to do something very special for you know some brand launches we look at mintra right i think uh, uh, you know uh, that that slick feeling around fashion i think that's what uh, mintra does and um, i think on flipkart uh, uh, you know the experience is very uh, different it's 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 around ease of uh, you know buying ease of discovery ease of uh, looking at you know the right value proposition right i think that's how uh you know we look at uh, our customers and that's how our customers also perceive uh, between mintra and flipkart so uh but you will find a lot of sellers uh, who do list on mintra as well as flipkart to tap into dis- different customer cohorts awesome next one is how does flipkart take care of fake reviews from sellers with the help of tech um uh i i think uh, fake reviews for uh, from customers i guess right i think that's uh, yeah i think customers bash was mentioned sir so we have uh, um, you know uh, we have uh, specific teams working on these charters we have trust and safety teams which work on these charters uh, to take off uh, you know fake reviews we also have a very important construct and uh, you know if you write uh, uh, reviews on flipkart you have to be a certified buyer on flipkart right? i think that's that's another very very important uh, aspect to look at 
We have a question coming from Vibha. She would like to know how do you communicate recommendations to the sellers? Do you generate reports or on some sections for seller pages? Uh, Vibha, we use both. Uh, we use reports as well as uh, you know, uh, you know, pushing it through different pages that uh, you know sellers typically look at. Uh, these can be listing pages. These can be, you know, product. Uh, sorry, um, uh, business summary pages. Uh, we also generate certain offline reports and send it to, uh, you know, the relevant people in the seller ecosystem themselves, right? So as I said, uh, we have to deliver insights and recommendations to people who actually can make decisions on them. Right? So we reach out through multiple channels, uh, whatever and wherever uh, things are appropriate, we reach out in that way. Next question, how are those customer seller insights, insights used for sales, such as big billion days? Massively, I think, uh, uh, you know, big billion days is, uh, you know, a massive event and uh, we want, uh, you know, the right uh, kind of inventory, the right kind of selection into, you know, our warehouses and their warehouses. Uh, so, you know, the recommendations around uh, inventory, uh, the recommendations around uh, pricing, the recommendations on where you would want to keep your stocks, uh, all these become very, very important. And, um, you know, the amplitude uh, or, uh, sorry, uh, the magnitude of these recommendations, the amount of push that we uh, give before uh, Big Billion Days, uh, you know, probably goes into a 50x or 100x territory, right? We, we will really, uh, you know, our sellers look forward to our recommendations and we bombard them with the same and they just lap it up. Uh, next question, how does data science come into the picture for the seller, seller ecosystem? Uh, so, uh, as you would have imagined that, uh, you know, most of these models, some of them are statistical models and a uh, lot of them are, uh, you know, uh, data science models uh, that uh, generate uh, these recommendations. We also heavily use, uh, you know, data sciences in determining uh, product quality, um, you know, figuring out uh, fakes, uh, figuring out, um, uh, you know, uh, some of the other, uh, you know, aspects around, uh, f you know, uh, fulfillment, uh, uh, you know, propensity to cancel orders or, you know, fulfillment construct. So there are a lot of places in uh, seller ecosystem which are led by intelligence. I think at this scale, honestly speaking, uh, it's, it's very hard for us to, uh, you know, solve complicated problems without the use of data sciences, right? I think it's a very bread and butter for uh, our teams. During COVID or similar unpredictable times, how do you scale your system or change your selling strategies? Uh, so uh, very good question. And I think, uh, I, I don't think that uh, historically, uh, you know, and, and, and I, 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 I think uh, I would be older than a lot of cohort here. Uh, I don't think that we have been through, uh, you know, a disaster scenario as grave as uh, COVID. Uh, and I would say that, uh, you know, our teams have worked brilliantly and in, in very creative ways to come up with the right, uh, you know, solve for the sellers, right? Uh, there are different challenges that we have tried to cope up uh, in, in terms of, you know, sellers trapped into containment zones, their supplies trapped into containment zones, uh, the changes in buyer preferences. So for example, uh, you know, today we know that uh, buyers are not buying um, you know, your next best shoe or, you know, the next best fashion accessory. Uh, but they are definitely buying, uh, you know, the lounge pants or, you know, the t-shirts that, uh, you know, all of us are, uh, you know, uh, lapping up or the laptops and, you know, mobile phones. So we have changed, uh, 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 you know, our models accordingly, uh, according to the buying preferences, according to, you know, how and, you know, what is easy for the sellers, et cetera, what is uh, easy on their working capital systems, you know, what can give them uh, quicker profits and, you know, bring, bring them back to life. I think that's, that's one of the other things that we have been really, really working hard on. Uh, we have time for one last question, Manasvi, and that is what are the challenges you face to migrate insights pipeline to cloud service, if any? Um, so, <clears throat> Uh, we have our own cloud infrastructure, right? and uh, uh, you know because of the sheer scale at which Flipkart operates, uh, uh, very few uh, cloud providers other than uh, you know our uh, closest uh, peer would be able to take up that load. Right? 
and uh, i think uh, our last speaker is is probably closest to that uh, area uh, and uh, you know we have a brilliant uh, and a very uh, um, uh, you know sophisticated cloud platform in house and i think we we are proud to use that okay that's that's where it is so we don't have a migration person to do it awesome once again thank you so much marasvi for sharing all those insights with us uh that's all the time we had for your session but thank you so much for answering all the questions uh before we move forward i'm going to quickly post a poll on your screens this is for all the participants we would like you to rate the talk that you just attended so you'll see a poll on your screen now you just give it 10 more seconds and we'll close the poll awesome once again thank you so much manasvi have a lovely day thank you so much thank you let's move on continuing with our sessions let's welcome our next set of speakers sumit grover and deepri agrawal Sumit is an entrepreneur by heart and a passionate leader with significant experience in creating fast-paced technology intensive startups. He's been with Flipkart for the last 6 years and is a senior director Catalog Edge. DP is a senior engineering manager in the Central Platforms group at Flipkart. She is responsible for pl platform services like objective storage, messaging, security and compliance services. Sumit and Deepti, the screen is all yours. Over to you guys. Thank you, Amanda. Just waiting for Deepti to join as well. Yeah, to join. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Manasvi, uh, for the wonderful. Uh, insights for the salary ecosystem how how flipkart is actually investing and continuously building the salary ecosystem uh so folks we are going to talk about another strategic investment uh that's one of the foundational piece uh for any large e-commerce uh, organization and uh, that's the, the name does not come with a surprise it's uh, the product catalog uh so good hi could you Sorry to interrupt. Could you please present the deck? Could you go on presentation mode? Yes. Is it is it okay now? Yes. Thank you so much. Right. So we'll be Deepthi and I will be actually walking you through the product catalog and why it actually. Uh, is a strategic investment right from day 0 of of any large e-commerce organization so product catalog is the the word does not sound new uh, we have seen it we see it day in day out it has been around for ages in fact the first catalog uh, was uh, as per some history the first catalog was somewhere around in uh, 1498 or 500 years back and uh, it was it has always been used not just for uh, the not just for the uh, transactions to the customers it also uh, is used to enable the supply chain lot of things that where catalog is used is actually uh, not seen or not visible by the end consumers like you know us uh, who actually goes and actually buys in the as a last mile shopper either from a retail uh, outlet or or from any e-commerce platform but right from the manufacturer when it uh, uh, who actually starts building or conceive an idea of a product he actually shares it either with a list of uh, to the distributors or to the potential buyers who will actually market it for him and he comes up with a you know lot of uh, cataloging uh, booklets or you know pdfs as of today uh, describing that product from that time onwards uh, the, the product conception actually the uh, instant uh, it actually takes place 
uh, people actually uh, as of today are more used to in business to business cases they are more used to enter those product information in their respective erps through certain human operations and then going from there a lot of uh, marketing uh, catalogs or so called flyers uh, you know which are also referred to catalog uh, you know mail order catalog uh, airplane uh, catalog all those things also have uh, certain other details about the the product uh, including their prices their sizes or the variations that are actually present so catalog is something that is not new uh, then why it still becomes a strategic investment right i mean if it's been there for around 500 years so we are pretty sure that people would have actually done and dusted uh, this problem there could be a lot of products that would be available uh, which can actually just be bought and integrated right so where is the challenge why it's it still continues to be a strategic investment right so let's look at the uh, the catalog what what would a catalog mean for for anybody or for an organization is it a database of the facts related to the products uh be it certain set of images certain set of specifications that come directly from either the manufacturers or certain reviewers uh, the third party uh you know players or certain kind of use cases uh with respect to that you can actually drill you can use this drilling machine to to drill a hole on on the floor or on a, a con concrete wall or or things of this nature right what does a catalog stand for in this uh in this world where human interaction gets minimized and everything actually get converts into digitized clicks let's see <clears throat> in a in a regular world when we actually talked about it where there are a lot of human interaction right from let's say manufacturer to the distributor even if there is a transportation involved it again goes through a chain of human operations where the billing is done reference to the catalog is done uh the distributor enters it into his own catalog his or her own catalog uh sends it to the to the uh, you know brick and mortar shop around the corner the neighborhood shops uh, or the malls and there uh, customers will go pick and choose read certain things about the product on the product label itself try it out and then take either take them or leave them what happens in the e-commerce right e-commerce is not just about uh, having a uh, tie ups with just a few select manufacturers e-commerce uh especially in india is all about being an open marketplace uh, you have to democratize uh the sellers which we just heard right i mean there's a lot of investment being done to actually enable the seller ecosystem so that uh, every mom and pop store owner every entrepreneur at heart can actually get onboarded with a list of products that he or she wants to sell to the rest of the india democratizing uh product creation means you are actually getting a product defined in multiple multiple languages with a different let's say contextual information that people want to do so there could be no structure to to those definitions at all and still everybody wants to sell it as a platform it will become your responsibility to able to comprehend it so that you are able to maintain factual correctness and the quality of the the description so that your end consumer is able to actually uh, take a decision on that if your end consumers actually abandons it it's a waste effort of the entire ecosystem there is market intelligence there are con content syndication systems a lot of players third party players have actually come up who are also called catalog aggregators they actually provide certain enriched set of informations all these things needs to marry the selection if i have to just give an example right i mean if you just think about the the universe of the product that are actually available or that actually keep churning out on year on year uh, in this entire global world so called global world because you know geographical boundaries are no longer valid when it comes to you know uh, wishful shopping or or need based shopping as well i'll give you an example uh, how many times do you actually get to see the same set of clothes that you are wearing be it a t-shirt be it a trouser skirt shoe whatever it may be uh exact same and just forget about the electronic accessories for the minute but just the clothing right clothing or a home decor item you actually come across hundreds or thousands in pre covid area when it was everything was normal 
we would actually come across hundreds or thousands of people day in and day out. Every day we would be traveling, every day we would be. How many times we get to see exact same product that we are wearing is somebody else also wearing the same. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible. It is possible. It is very less likely. Now look at it in the entire lifetime. You have actually grown up for last, you know, X amount of tens of years. You would have seen it day in, day out. You are not, you are, there will be a handful of instances where you were able to see it. Now just multiply all these things. Hundreds and thousands daily for tens of years. It's billions of the selection that we are talking about. Billions of documents at the product. How do you actually get the entire selection on board? If you want to be a national player, you cannot choose to be a player. You cannot choose to be a spokesperson or for only a few brands. You have to enable everybody. If you are a, if you are a neutral marketplace, you have to enable everybody because each one of those seller ecosystem has actually found a way to the end consumers. And if a significant player like Flipkart has to have all the selection, otherwise the customer will actually get disappointed. Human thinking of product. There's a, there's a classical statement about it, which is again, uh, around hundreds of years back, which was actually said, people need to make holes in the wall. They are not looking, they do not actually think about it that I need a drill. They, they think in the terms that I need to make a hole in the wall. Now, what would fix my problem? If there is somebody sitting, standing just next next door to them, and he can actually, play, uh, you know, drill that hole, they will just ask him, or him or her, or they will actually think about drills or start doing something. So human thinks about concepts. Product description from manufacturer is is required, is necessary, but not sufficient to actually describe a product. The product is consumed by very different, di very differently by different parties, right? At the end of the day, if you actually look at the shopping journey, be it an e on an e-commerce platform or any other platform, right? At the end of the day, other than it's a digital product or a service, it gets to be physically delivered to you in your hands. It's tangible. You can actually see it. You can actually feel it at the end of the day because you have to consume it. Now. When you are as a consumer, you just want to know about each and you're very specific about its compatibility. For example, if you're buying an electronic accessory, you are very particular about the color, the shade, if you're actually buying a, a lifestyle, you are particular about each and every specification, right? A seller is not particular about that. He wants to buy the bundles of that because he wants to know, okay, uh, for this particular product, I need to buy this much of these much sizes because this is what is the the, the, the breakup of my demographic of, you know, uh, of my customer base that I look at it. The supply chain, they are not interested in the whether the product is priced low or high. Is it red or green? It is medium or large. They are interested in what is my packaging uh, size? What is the weight of the product? Is it allowed? It, does it actually carry the interstate taxation? There are various different uh, consumption patterns with this reference ID of same, a product identifier, right? We just summarize what we just said, right? The volume in the category when we actually talk about the t-shirt, trousers, shops, uh, shoes, sandals, headphones, specs, cups, saucer, you just keep on adding it's thousands of categories. For all of those categories, there are hundreds and thousands of manufacturers right from uh, people who are doing it for themselves in a very, very low scale, uh, either as a charity or for meeting their, their needs or things being manufactured at scale in factories. But there are manufacturers, hundreds and thousands of manufacturers. The variety within that manufacturing, be it because of the size, be it because of the uh, you know, color, be it because of anything else, the dimensions, the certain other attributes, there will be significant variety and the selection depth goes into millions. The cardinality is mind boggling. It turns up into 
multi billion dollar multi billion documents if i call document as a product and the minute you add the dimensions for let's say supply chain dimension for these values the consumer dimensions of this values including the images including the video uh, uh manufacturer dimension of this values including the taxation including the 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 commissions it's it's just goes uh the 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 dimensions and the uh, and the volume itself just just goes to a mind boggling way however as a as a standardized e-commerce player you have to be customer focused the customer focus cannot be lost hence it's up to you it's your responsibility to be consistent to give the quality and the trust that the customer at this scale would always always accept these are non negotiable nobody will ask for it by the way uh, that you know i need all these aspects these are standards whenever we actually enter and this also you know recalls a, a classical example if we actually go to a restaurant and we ask them to get the food faster that does not mean that we are asking that okay you do not have to cook it well we still expect it to cook to be cooked very well we still expect it expect it to be presented equally well it's just that we want it quicker the same thing we want the entire selection but consistency quality and trust has to still be maintained what does it mean to us right consistency can actually be driven uh, by uh, a lot of procedures a lot of templates you know standard operating procedures and templatizing but quality and trust let me just walk you guys through through a few examples right we just did a uh, you know just search on on one of the e-commerce site and search for cooking set it's very likely by the way that cooking set is being referred to as a stack of plates in a certain area by certain people uh, by certain set of customers but this is if you actually do it at the end of the day if your source of truth says the cooking set is a is a stack of plates your entire discovery channel which is your, your search your merchandising your uh, your sellers they will all refer to it as a cooking set and this is what we do let's take a look at this one from a quality and more than quality the trust perspective here right you are looking for a hair straightener now you are seeing four hair straighteners uh, they are different because they are all coming with a different price range they all have exact same review stars they are differently priced their information is exactly same 1000 watts each 599 429 445 349 right? right imagine you go to a shop what would be your next question to the shopkeeper right and you are looking for a shop let's look at this one you search for a shoes right you see the same lego logo in three out of four shoes one shoe is actually from a prominent brand which one can recall but there are spelling errors there now everywhere right i mean instead of man i mean men it is written man may be acceptable once again depending upon the customer base that you are looking at but let's assume for a minute this prominent brand was genuinely offering this much of a discount for their shoe you as a customer would you have the confidence to actually buy relatively speaking looking genuine you know out of 3 out of 4 the first one looking much more genuine of a of that brand will you be able to spend that money that yes you will get an original product this is where the trust issue comes into picture it's not no longer about just the quality it's also about the trust now how should you trust how would you trust the uh, the the ratings or or the description here when you are actually totally it is it is ambiguous right quality and trust goes a long way and they are very difficult to project very very difficult to maintain and hence it has to be done built in your dna in entire systems and and of course in 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 your operation it should actually reflect in that right so the role of catalog in e-commerce at the end of the day if you see is the prime accountability is to enable what you see is what you get 
it works as a birth registry for any product that comes that a seller wants to list a manufacturer wants to list all the way to the consumer getting it at their doorstep the same product identifier with the different dimensions of the attributes that are being consumed all the way across by changing all the hops right from the uh, the manufacturer to the warehousing from warehousing to different states from different states to the uh, to the local warehousing and from the local warehousing to the last mile delivery at your doorstep what you see is what you get is a prime enabler enable back catalog unless an e-commerce company wants to invest into it it cannot get it right just imagine some product identifier getting changed in the middle of it right today tonight i actually thought i have made a, uh, you know an error and i will go ahead and change it the entire cycle breaks you do not know whether you ordered uh, the you know small size you will actually get a medium size or you will get something else i think there was an article just a few days back that someone had actually ordered uh, some oil from one of the prominent e-commerce site but he he or she actually got a, a a pair of earbuds right so these are the things so it is responsible for identification for creation it's the source of truth not just for the for the transacting entities it's a source of truth for the entire discovery funnel the enrichment the more enrichment it will have the more correctness it will have the better discovery channels that will work it is also responsible for your compliance compliance is not only about you know the selling rights that somebody is actually authorized to sell it or not of course it is also about the compliance is also about by the way brand infringement uh, the duplicates so called that we talk about uh, selling rights whether somebody is authorized distributor or not objectionable con content nsfw not suitable for work you know uh, these are the the acronyms and general other regulatory compliance like very recent example and i think in the last session somebody asked also about covid response all of a sudden a regulatory uh, you know uh, uh, the guidance came that mask with three uh, three tier I, i i do not know the exact term but yeah the the mask with the three tier and all have to actually be priced at this level somebody needs to detect right in a systemic way and that source of truth entity comes to catalog if you are able to detect that this is an essential or you are able to detect that this price this product has actually has to be controlled by price you actually send those signals all the way back to the seller ecosystem to the pricing systems to the supply chain system that yes this can be delivered right so hence that is what it is eventually leading to customer quality and trust perception so it's accountable for universal product identification storage serving and customer quality and trust perception this is where you actually see a uh, catalog at flipkart uh, you you can actually see the itemization the grouping uh, the various size the sleeve type the filters this is all the strength of a catalog that actually can uh, enable this kind of an experience uh when you are actually looking for a cooking set at flipkart the key business objectives it's very easy to say that you know uh, uh to have a vision it's not easy by the way but it's very very ambitious to have a vision to actually become a, a national player in e-commerce and have all those billions of products selection in place be able to measure the quality of that selection depth that is being maintained hence cost of doing business becomes a key construct for catalog just imagine the the lifestyle which used to churn pre covid era the lifestyle every four months the season changes it used to be six months it actually get came to four months now it is actually getting reduced to three months that's something called fast fashion uh, which actually get disposed of uh, very very soon right so three months two months millions of products get churned out if you actually end up spending 50 cents per product you are talking about hundreds and millions of uh, dollars of investment per annum there is no roi for that because not every product is going to get even sold by the way not every product is, that is why the manufacturers actually are you know so particular about with how they will actually price the products where they have to give the major discounts the business coverage the categories you see at flipkart right i mean all the categories right from the grocery to the to the mobile phones right from your kitchen appliances to the gardening tools it is it is amazing set of 
all these categories have to be enabled via via the, the flexibility of catalog modeling in keeping in uh, mind the speed to market and the value propositions eventually generating the user experience with respect to selection depth richness quality consistency for sellers ease of cataloging and listing and of course compliant 100% compliant that's it from my side i will hand it over to deepthi to actually walk you uh, all to uh, through the how it gets actually translated into the technology world and how we are actually addressing that over to you deepthi thanks so much so i will have my screen so i'll be uh, covering uh, like some said uh, the view of the stakeholders like who are the major stakeholders for catalog Uh, what are the key objectives for each of those stakeholders? What are their problems, and how, and uh, what kind of capabilities we have built uh, in the technology world to be able to address these problems? So let's first look at uh, what are the different stakeholders. Right, first is the sellers. So uh, sellers uh, is the entity through which we source the content. Uh, like sellers, we would have a different content syndication partners, brands, manufacturers, and so on. So I'm grouping all of this into sellers. Uh, what sellers mean is a way to be able to list uh, their products on uh, on a catalog in a very very easy way, in a quick way, right? Uh, and they want a very uh, fast turnaround times. Let's say if they list a product today, they don't want to wait for forty eight hours to be able to see their listing. They want it instantly, right? Uh, the other um, tenet for them is they don't want to give a lot of uh, detailed information, right? so if you keep going back and forth to the seller that okay give me this information give me this information it's going to be painful for them so what they want is a easy and quick way to list products on any e-commerce catalog on the other side we have buyers and uh, buyers they have a different needs they want to know everything about a product right and uh, depending on the kind of category they are uh, shopping in they would have different kind of knowledge needs so let's say if uh, you're buying something in a lifestyle category you would like to look at um, high quality images you would like to zoom in and see uh, what the pattern looks like what what are the hues and you you want uh, say rich images versus if you are say an electronics buyer you would want say detailed specifications you want capability to compare different models you want um, say uh, what are the uh, what what is what is the latest in this particular model right so there are different kinds of uh, needs for a buyer uh, based on the category you are shopping in and then uh, buyers also have different needs in terms of um, how they want to search right um, so let's say they would want to search in their language they would want to search by what they are comfortable with they would use the terminology that they are comfortable with which may not necessarily be with uh, be the same as how we store catalog uh third is photo studios um, those are the um, uh, channels or avenues through which we create catalog right so uh, a very important part of uh, creating catalog is uh, doing photo shoots and then uh, based on the photo shoots writing catalog content for it and what a photo studio would need from us is um, low cost photo shoots um, with a high quality right not everyone has um, say high end camera then they want to be able to do these photo shoots in a cost effective manner and uh, then finally comes business teams um, and uh, what business teams need is that everything should be perfect it should be uh, compliant it should be factually correct they don't uh, care too much about uh, how much time it takes how many iterations you have to do how many times you have to reach out to the seller they they don't uh, attach a lot of value to that but what they need is uh, whatever enters the system it has to be correct and it has to be compact right so all of these uh, different stakeholders are enabled through catalog uh unfortunately though there are conflicting needs so if you look at um say uh, sellers versus business teams right sellers want to be able to sell in a easy and quick manner right um and they just need that okay when i come in to sell and i just upload my listings uh, it should just go live versus a conflicting need from the business team that everything has to be compliant everything has to be factual which means there has to be a lot of manual checking similarly when you look at buyers versus sellers um, buyers want to know everything about a product and uh, sellers they are uh, they don't have a lot of incentive for giving a lot of detailed information right so even though uh, the more information they provide it is going to be easier for getting more uh, customers but then they don't want a lot of iterations they would say ki okay whatever you need just tell me in one shot 
So again, there's a uh, conflicting need between buyers and sellers. So now, um, how do we address all these conflicting interests? And more importantly, how do we do it in a scalable manner? Uh, let's look at um, how the overall world of information has evolved. And this is something that will also um, apply to the world of uh, cataloging. We look at it with respect to three lenses. First is the richness of information, uh, which means how deep or how rich is the information that you are able to provide on the topic at hand, right? Whether it is just factual information or does it provide you um, semantic meaning to it? Does, does it give you a way to navigate to related products, related information, and so on? Next is, uh, what is the cost involved in gathering all of this information from different sources? And then finally, once you have this information, how quickly or how, um, in, in, uh, how agile you are in, in being able to iterate and improve upon this information? I'll uh, uh, explain how this has uh, worked in the uh, world of information. And uh, the example that we'll take is uh, the dictionaries. Right? So the dictionaries have evolved from being so earlier, um, if, you, if you just take an example of, uh, say, a simple yellow pages or, say, an Oxford dictionary, right? Uh, what it is, is it's, it's a compilation of words, right? Uh, if you know exactly what word you're looking for and you're looking for a meaning for that specific word, you'll be able to find that information, right? Um, your problem is addressed, but then you are limited to that particular word. You don't have a lot of knowledge around the meaning of the word. I mean, obviously, you'll know the uh, factual meaning of it, but you'll not have an understanding of that word, right? Uh, then comes uh, encyclopedia, which will give you extensive depth on a subject. It will give you all the relationships around that whole concept that you're looking for. But just like dictionary, it's, it's something that gets very free. Uh, the iterations are very, very slow. So hardly, say, once in a year, you would see a refresh in an edition of a dictionary on an encyclopedia. And in both dictionary and encyclopedia, the cost um, of sourcing that information is going to be, say, medium to high. The information that you'll get uh, in a dictionary is going to be, say, low to medium. And in an encyclopedia, you'll get a lot of rich information, but then at a very high cost. The world uh, has now evolved to something like an urban dictionary or a Wikipedia world where you are able to do extensive research um, around a topic. You have a way to navigate to related concepts. Um, and more importantly, the information is frequently updated. You are able to do quick iterations. The moment something new is available, it's already there on Wikipedia. So this is the world where uh, we want our catalog to be. Um, the cost of information is uh, what we want to be low, uh, which means the crowdsourcing model of Wikipedia is what we want to adopt. We want to be very, very agile, which means um, the latest and greatest information about any product should be available on our uh, platform. And the depth of the information or the richness of the information should be high, right? So if I have to uh, look at this journey, so from a dictionary to a Wikipedia, how, how do we evolve in a product world? Uh, this is what catalog needs to uh, say evolve into from being just a knowledge or uh, being a store of factual information to a knowledge repository or a knowledge uh, warehouse, which stores semantic information about all the products. And it closely mirrors how a user or a uh, actual buyer would look at catalog. Um, so now, how do we build this for e-commerce? I'll just quickly summarize uh, what, what are the objectives. First is we want to marry the world of factual information with the semantic understanding, which means uh, being closer to how users want to shop on Flipkart, shop on the uh, e-commerce platform. An example here would be that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in the uh, once uh, the lockdown gets over and people uh, are going back to office uh, and they want to do a wardrobe, wardrobe refresh, right? Uh, what would they search for? Would they search for, say, check office wear, or would they say, white shirt with black checks or blue stripes right? they would they would search by what they are looking for what what is the real world need for them right so how do we marry the the semantic understanding uh, that the user has with the factual information that is available in catalog we want to do it with minimal dependency on sellers uh, we saw in a previous uh, slide that uh, 
if there is too much of back and forth uh, and you keep reaching out to seller for more information, it is very likely that the seller will churn out. Right? So we want to do this with minimal dependency on sellers. We want to be able to do it quickly and in an agile manner and more, uh, most importantly at a, a low cost because the scale at which we are operating, um, it, it is very, very important that we uh, scale up our operations at a low cost. Right? So all of these requirements make uh, catalog a fairly complex and an exhaustive system. Um, on one hand, there are uh, different ways of sourcing content. Uh, on the other hand, there are so many categories that you have to get uh, uh, information about. And then uh, more importantly, you have to make sense of all of this data, right? Uh, ultimately, uh, like we uh, discussed earlier, we want to be the Wikipedia for all of product info. So how do we do it? Right? Broadly speaking, uh, the technology behind all of this can be divided into four main pivots. The first is, how do you acquire content, right? There are different sources that we talked about. There are sellers, there are brands, there are manufacturers, there are competition websites that you can call from, there are um, content syndication partners and so on, right? Now, all of these uh, um, content providers that we have, uh, they'll have their own vocabulary, they'll have their own uh, ways of expressing catalog information, right? One seller might call uh, a certain trait as say natural, another seller might say, this, call the same thing as organic, and some other sellers might call the same thing by different names. How do we understand all of this? How do we build taxonomies to be able to map different kinds of uh, languages, different kinds of vocabularies into something that the rest of the Flipkart uh, ecosystem understands? So this is where uh, the taxonomy mapping or ontology mapping plays a major role. Uh, the other uh, uh, challenge here is the uh, isolation. So if you look at the different uh, kinds of sources, each operates at a different scale. So there are SMBs who will uh, probably upload, say, a couple of hundred or thousand products in a day, while, uh, say, a content syndication partner could upload a million books in a day, right? And you don't want to starve out, say, a small seller um, if there is a big feed from, say, a content syndication partner that comes in. So the, uh, the challenge lies in building hardware and software isolations between uh, all these different uh, sourcing partners and ensuring that we have a deterministic and uh, say uh, reliable throughput that we can promise to each of our partners. So these are some of the challenges in the acquired world. Uh, in the validate world, um, uh, so okay, what does validation even mean, right? So let's say if a seller is uploading say a catalog for uh, mobiles. Now uh, there are certain uh, validations that uh, say the category team or uh, we being in the business for some time, we know uh, that we have to validate uh, say, um, a RAM uh, should typically be between, say, a couple of uh, GBs, right? Um, uh, say, uh, the size of the screen cannot be in meters, or there could be some basic validations uh, that you would need to apply. The challenge here is that the ecosystem evolves rapidly, right? Whatever validations you would have done for uh, ranges of a RAM or a ROM or capacity, uh, 10 years back is very different from what you do it now, right? So how do you ensure that those validations also evolve and those are also self-learning based on how the ecosystem is evolving. Those are some of the challenges in the validate world. Then comes transformation. So um, uh, uh, I talked about the uh, vocabulary part of the translation uh, uh, in the acquired world. The other part of transformation is how uh, do you extract information and enrich the catalog um, with more information so that you don't have to go back to the seller or the source to be able to get more information. So let's say whatever you can get out of the images or text or description is what you would want to uh, extract and then store it. You would also want to extract a lot of information that you could possibly store away for later for say things like compliance checks. And then finally, we come to serve layer. Uh, uh, Flipkart scale, uh, at Flipkart scale, you are typically serving anything between uh, say 20 to 30 million views per second, right? And that kind of a scale is served at uh, sub 10 ms latency. And uh, how do you do all of this at for a size of catalog which is which has say 500 million plus products? Those are some of the challenges in the serve world. And uh, how we have uh, tried to uh, solve this is uh, by creating different projections of the data. So let's say the same product um, requires a very different uh, level of detail in a product page versus what you show in a cart or a checkout page. So we've created all these different uh, projections of the data, which are stored in a materialized form, 
which are readily available as and when the request comes. So in the request path, you don't do a lot of um, uh, voodoo. You just uh, serve whatever is available and then you continuously keep it refreshed. So now uh, uh, the main challenge here is that the space, like I mentioned, is continuously evolving and each of the four pivots that we talked about, those have to be self-learning and those have to be continuously iterated upon, right? So what we uh, do um, at a high level, um, so I talked about the buyer perception and the seller pain, which are conflicting uh, levers for us. Similarly, the TAT, which is uh, required for the ops, uh, the photo shoots and other uh, operations, and the compliance and other checks. So all these four stakeholders that we talked about, there's a continuous um, loop between them. You uh, keep leveraging technology to uh, do all sorts of enrichment so that you are able to give all of this rich information to buyers. You are in the process reducing the seller pain because uh, you are doing all of this jugglery on the tech side uh, and you're not reaching back to the seller for this information and hence you are reducing the seller pain in the uh, process. Similarly, on the automation side, um, all these quality checks for compliance and other things that I talked about, you, uh, we are investing into building automated data science models to be able to do that. So that overall, the uh, turnaround time for sellers keeps reducing. And we are able to get into a space where when the sellers come to list a particular uh, product, the catalog is already ready for them. Right? And that's how we reduce the turnaround time for sellers and increase the latch on rate. So what I'll do is I'll talk about each of these challenges in a little more detail and I'll connect it back to how it uh, makes the lives of each of our stakeholders simpler. So the first um, uh, stakeholder that we talked about was seller. And just to recap, uh, their primary need uh, for a seller was a quick and easy and reliable way of listing, right? And we don't want to burden the seller with a lot of uh, ask for information. So the kind of tools we have built uh, for sellers are, uh, first is um, uh, data science models for image, um, attribute extraction from images. So if you look at this image, you can see that this is a floral dress. Uh, it's a red and uh, blue in color, uh, it's uh, cut sleeves, it's medium length. So all of this information is already available as visual attributes and you really don't need to go back to the seller to ask all of this information. So these, uh, we've invested heavily into building uh, these models. Similarly, uh, on the text side, we have built models for uh, extracting information out of uh, descriptions. So if you look at this uh, typical description of a mug, you can see that uh, the brand, the category, uh, material, uh, ceramic, uh, capacity, uh, whether or not it is microwavable, all of this information is available in your description. And again, you don't need, need to go back to the seller. So we've, we've invested heavily into building these uh, uh, text extraction models uh, and uh, also invested into NLP to be able to um, extract all of this information and then also validate it. And similarly, auto classification. So if you look at um, the whole uh, cases and covers world, um, most of the information is available from the uh, image itself, um, the category, the, the theme, whether it's uh, ideal for a uh, male or a female, all of this information is available and we have built auto classification models for sellers so that uh, they don't have to provide all of these inputs manually. And finally, uh, we have invested into a universal catalog. Uh, what this means is that when the seller comes to us, um, uh, the products in most cases should be already available and they should be able to latch on instead of uh, having to provide all of this information. So there are certain categories like books, which are very structured and uh, the catalog is readily available through publishers and other channels. And you know, for certain categories, we have been, uh, you know, been able to achieve this uh, concept of universal catalog. Uh, next comes business. Uh, so we uh, discussed earlier that the ask from businesses uh, that your quality checks need to be thorough. If required, it should be uh, manually checked. Each and every product should be manually checked. Of course, that's not scalable. So how do we do it at scale? Which is where, um, again, um, uh, these tech capabilities come in. So uh, we've invested into building OCR models so that uh, we are able to read all the information that is available in the packaging, things like manufacturing date, which country they are coming from, what kind of, uh, uh, say, states they should be sold in. So all of this information we are able to extract through OCR. And then we have also invested into uh, image classification, which is um, primarily needed for compliance. So let's say, um, again, uh, NSF, uh, FW, um, religious sentiments, national flag abuse. So all of these 
um, uh, manual, uh, all of these compliance checks are automatically checked through these uh, image markers, which um, because it is done automatically, uh, the TAT for sellers reduces overall, and that is how it connects back to uh, reducing the seller pain. Uh, next comes uh, customer uh, delight or customer needs. And uh, uh, we discussed earlier, uh, customer wants to get all of the information that they need for uh, buying, and they need it in a way that is easy for them to consume. And they don't really need, um, say, uh, they need the real world representation of the product. So um, uh, let's say if you are watching a movie, say uh, Bahubali, and you like a particular sari, uh, you'll probably go and search by Bahubali sari, right? You will not search for white and red sari with golden border. Or probably if you uh, like a particular uh, shirt that Shah Rukh Khan was wearing in a particular movie, you'll go and search by Shah Rukh Khan shirt, right? You will not search by uh, blue shirt with polo collar and so on, right? So catalog stores uh, uh, factual information, but what the buyer is looking for is um, semantic information. They want it in a way that they are able to consume and they want it in a way that is meaningful for them. And they want it in a way that is uh, that is something that they can connect back to the real world. So what kind of tools and uh, technologies uh, uh, are required to power that? Uh, first of all, we should be able to mine uh, uh, relations between different products um, and, and their semantics. And we have invested into uh, this kind of a knowledge graph. I'm not sure if it is visible uh, to people who are seeing it uh, on their phones, but this shows how different products are related. What are the different concepts that come out of these products? And um, uh, as and when, a pro uh, say, a user looks for a particular product, what kind of real world entities it is closely related to. So this marries the whole uh, factual data with the semantic information. And then we have also invested into uh, machine translation capabilities to be able to serve vernacular content um, so that the users um, get content in a language of their choice. And then finally, uh, we, um, need to build products and tools for uh, catalog creation. And uh, uh, the ask from uh, the catalog creation, if you remember, was uh, they want to do high quality photo shoots with uh, say not so costly equipment. And uh, they want to be able to do it quickly. So what we have invested into is um, this management to model technology. So what this enables us to do is uh, shoot uh, product images uh, on these kind of mannequins and then stitch together um, uh, model images. Uh, it could be celebrity images, it could be any sort of models. So the turnaround time uh, of uh, the earlier model where you used to get models into your photo studios and shoot each and every product, that significantly reduces, right? Then uh, a second is 3D rendering. So especially for a category like uh, home and furniture where you want to actually see how the product will look uh, in your home against your actual, um, say, wall color and so on. Uh, we have invested into this uh, 3D rendering uh, technology where you are able to stitch together uh, different images captured from the camera and build a 3D view out of it. Uh, another is uh, mobile based cataloging and this is more uh, uh, say useful in say a lockdown kind of a uh, scenario also where you can simply say shoot images using whatever uh, say low cost camera uh, phone that you have and um, the, the app that we've built, Pictor, this will uh, actually edit all these photographs and ensure that it is compliant to all our guidelines, let's say a wide background, uh, say the right kind of resolution, and uh, in essentially ensuring that the users don't have to do, or the sellers don't have to do a lot of uh, processing on their side, and we make it a very low cost option for the small and medium businesses. So yeah, these are some of the technologies that we have invested into, and uh, the space continues to evolve. So yeah, uh, I'll open this up to questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Sumit and Deepti, for explaining the role of cataloging in e-commerce and for Flipkart. We do have uh, some questions which have come in, but I'm afraid we don't have too much time. So I'm going to quickly read out the first question. Uh, some of the products on Flipkart don't have specifications or details about them. How is Flipkart trying to solve this problem using tech? Sure. So I'll take that question. Um, so uh, like I mentioned, there are different uh, ways of sourcing content. Um, there are ways to uh, say, uh, go back to the seller who has listed the product. That is uh, the easiest that you can do, but then again, it's going to be a pain for the seller. 
so uh, wherever it is possible through uh, imagery so wherever visual attributes uh, are sufficient wherever the image is sufficient we are investing into uh, these image models to be able to extract those attributes and then we are also partnering with a lot of content syndication uh, vendors to be able to source content so these are some of the channels through which we are getting this information awesome next question talking about trust perspective there are so many products which say x percentage of discount and when we scroll through the comments people have brought it for much cheaper rates so is it because the tech teams provide the seller the data of trending products so they change the cost how does flipkart and shop fair play so yeah um, so uh, like uh, manasvi mentioned in the previous uh, talk also there is a, a whole dedicated team uh, that uh, looks at the trust and safety aspects um, of both the seller side listing as well as cataloging and that includes the reviews and ratings so uh, it's a iterative process and we are continuously say uh, uh, ensuring that the information that is available to sellers is something that they can use for actual decision making a uh, what percentage of catalog data is searchable so um if i have to just go by very rough numbers um 70% of the catalog does not uh, get a single page view and uh, that's just a factor of the scale at which we get listings uh, what we are investing into is um uh, get to a stage where almost 100% of the catalog becomes searchable what are the technologies used for isolation of catalog source um, that is small seller versus big sellers sure so uh, this is something that i briefly covered in the acquire part of uh, catalog so uh, what we have invested into is uh, uh, um, building priority in so the, the queuing system that we use is kafka and we have uh, invested into building uh, open source uh, version of priority kafka where you can um, say segregate by p0 p1 p2 and uh, there are quotas allocated to each uh, of these priorities just to ensure that um, uh, different priority levels don't get starved out and those priorities keep getting bumped up so as if let's say there's a uh, listing that was listed say a couple of uh, days back and it has still not uh, made it to the uh, compliance checks um, it automatically keeps uh, the priority keeps increasing so that um, it gets the right kind of uh, attention from both uh, automated as well, as well as manual checks awesome and the last question for this segment dp is let's say a user types red tape in the search bar how do we ensure that the search result throws red tape shoes as a brand versus showing tapes which are red in color from the catalog so here we have invested into a uh, standardization and one of the uh, standardization uh, that we have done is along brands so um, we have built a whole registry of brands which are uh, available on flipkart and uh, yeah that that's that's one of the ways in which um, uh, this is understood the other is the personalization of the context so let's say if the user has been searching for uh, say shoes we know that um, uh he's looking for a particular brand of shoes and not really maybe the color so there are different uh, uh, levers that we use and uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, initiatives uh, which are being taken up in the search and discovery team to be able to address that awesome thank you so much that's all the time we had to answer questions that came in sumit and deepthi once again thank you so much for those in insights and for answering all of the questions I'm going to quickly launch a poll. Uh, this is for all of the participants. Uh, please do share feedback on Sumit and Deepthi's session. Launching the poll now. Gayatri I see that you have raised your hand if you could just give me a uh, time I will ping you and uh, check what the issue is thank you uh 10 more seconds to go uh, folks who have not yet voted there's a question on your screen uh, we're asking you to rate the talk by Sumit and Deepthi okay
Okay. And we're done. Thank you so much for folks who uh, voted. Okay, who's ready to have some fun? Um, I hope some of you all are nodding your heads at home. Uh, you also stand a chance to win girly cool prizes because it's time for virtual quiz. Okay, so the rules are really simple. We are going to be doing this on Zoom. Um, there are going to be three rounds. Each round will have four questions each. Uh, in the first round, uh, four lucky winners stand a chance to win uh, EGVs worth rupees 500. In round two, two lucky winners stand a chance to win Flipkart EGVs worth rupees 1,000. And in round three, two lucky winners stand a chance to win EGVs worth rupees 2,000. Okay, so three rounds, four questions. Um, it's going to happen on your screens. Are you all ready for round one? I hope you all are saying yes, because round one begins now. You'll see four questions on your screens. You need to guess the answers right. And you stand a chance to win EGVs worth rupee 500. We have 10 more seconds, so quickly vote. Okay, I'm just going to give you all a few more seconds because I can see that people are taking time to read the questions. Closing the poll in three, two, one. Okay, um, if you're curious to know what the answers were for round one, the first question was, which was the first category launched on Flipkart? 83% of you all got it right. The answer is books. The second question is, um, how many active customers does Flipkart currently have? Uh, not too many of you all got this right. The right answer was 150 million plus. The third question is, when was Flipkart's first big billion day sale held? 74% uh, of you got this answer right, and the right answer is 2014. And the last question, which brand was launched as the country's first flash sale? Again, most of you all got this right. The answer is Xiaomi. Okay, are you guys ready for round two? Yes? Okay, let's do it. Round two on your screens. Now, questions might be slightly more tough but the prize is worth it. 1,000 rupees Flipkart EVs up for grabs for two lucky winners who get the answers right. Okay, quickly, we have just 10 seconds to go. Quickly cast your votes. And the poll ends now. Uh, curious to know what the answers are for this round. So the first question was, what was the first product uh, sold on Flipkart? And the right answer, which most of you got, um, sorry, actually most of you all didn't get this right. Uh, I know the options were slightly tricky, but the right answer is a book title, Leaving Microsoft to Change the World. A lot of you all thought it was the monk who sold this Ferrari, but the right answer is Leaving Microsoft to Change the World. Um, question number two is, what is the name of Flipkart's private label brand for appliances? Um, again, all of you all guessed almost all of the answers, but the right answer is Mark you. 
third question, which Bollywood celebrity did Flipkart bring on board for its first reality show, Entertainer Number no. One? And forty-eight percent of you got the answer absolutely right. It's Varun Dhawan. And the last question in this round is: How many events do we ingest per week to generate seller insights and recommendations? You guys were listening carefully to the presentation. The right answer, which fifty-seven percent of you got, is one forty million. Awesome. And uh, the last round of our quiz is round three. Questions slightly more tough, but two thousand rupees worth EGVs up for grabs for two lucky winners. Are you ready? Round three is live now. I'm going to give you all a little bit more time because uh, the questions are a little more tough and the answers are slightly more tricky. Okay, almost time up. And the quiz ends now. Okay, let's see what you guys guessed in this round. First question, what is the name of Flipkart's homemade brand for refurbished products? 63% of you got it absolutely right. The answer is too good, spelled uh, numeric two followed by G-U-D. Uh, second question, what is the name of Flipkart's virtual currency that can be used on the app? Again, all of you all got it right. It is Supercoins. The third question is, in April, Flipkart launched a first-of-its-kind interactive game show. What was the name of the show? 49% of you guessed Sub Kelo Sub Jito, but that seems to be like a really old show and not something that Flipkart started. The right answer is Kya Bolti Public. And the last question was, when was the first catalog published? Um, again, not too many of you all got this right, but the right answer is 1498. Awesome. Um, that brings us to the end of our quiz. I hope you guys enjoyed it, although it was virtually. And congratulations to all the winners. We don't have your names yet, but you will receive an email from us with your gift voucher details early next week. Moving on, join me in welcoming our last speaker for today, Saurabh Tandon. Saurabh is a seasoned engineering leader with experience in finding product and engineering strategy, developing product roadmaps, hiring and building strong teams, and an engineering culture. He has been with Flipkart since 2013 and currently leads Flipkart's efforts to enable customers from a payments, lending, and insurance perspective. Saurabh, take it away. Thanks, Amanda. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Sure. I'll start sharing my screen. Good evening, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the earlier sessions from my esteemed colleagues um, and had some takeaways. Uh, both the challenges uh, on the seller side and catalog are big problems to solve. And um, we are deeply uh, invested in making them um, solve through technology and scale uh, over a period of time. Um, and uh, while we have done a lot of work in the last 10 years uh, on those products, um, it's 
it's a continuous journey there is still a lot more to do and this uh, and the team has a lot more desire to do uh, towards that so uh, now coming up to uh, quickly on uh, my introduction um, Amanda, I can't move the slides. Uh, Saurabh, could you just maybe present it again, please? I'll try that. Yeah. Yeah, works. Thank you. No worries. Yeah. Uh, quickly, I have been working on many problems at EPK uh, for the last six plus years. Um, and primarily last one year we have been involving solving for some credit problem for our customers and uh, um, that is what I will be going um, walking you guys all through. It has been an interesting journey um, using commerce data, e-com data in the lending space, helping financial institute extend credit to our customers. Um, uh, how that journey has been. Um, I hope I'll do justice um, and you will enjoy this abridged version of our journey where we have tried to establish new paradigms, learn from different uh, larger players or different, um, uh, you know, across the world, what's happening on the technology space in, uh, in this space and um, try to bring our own uh, synthesis of our own learning. And that is what I'm going to present today. To start with, um, this, largely this will be the agenda. Uh, we will talk about um, first, why is credit important for commerce? Um, we'll look at some of the key metrics over, over there, um, how it is different for the customers who have credit available and then um, use a retail platform versus those customers who do not have that credit available. Then we will look at how Lending is an old space. Lending exists since the time trading exists. So lending has been there. We look at how other banks and financial institutes have been doing it till date. And I won't go really back from the origin. Uh, I'll largely talk about mostly last, for how it has evolved in last 20, 30 years. Um, and then what's happening now. And that is where we will start looking at new age lending. Uh, we'll look at some of the peers across the world and then um, we'll try to uh, go deep dive into what we did it uh, and how we did it, uh, how we approach the problem. In the end, we'll try to summarize the entire session and um, the learnings around it. So to start with, what's the impact of credit um, on e-commerce? Um, how does it impact uh, the commerce in general or retail uh, or the retail transactions. On the right hand side, you see a bar graph, um, an interesting bar graph. As you see the item prices at the X axis and uh, the height of the bar reflects how many of those units are bought using just the EMI. EMI is the equated monthly um, installment. I'm sure, I'm hoping we all are familiar with this. The, we take a loan from some place and pay them on um, on monthly equated, um, every month we pay the um, share of it. That is what uh, EMI stands for. If you look at it, we have uh, bucketed the price points and um, um, less than 3,000, 3,000, 6,000, up to like 25,000 to 35,000 and greater than 35,000 products. Um, and as you see, as the price range grows up for the custom, uh, customer, EMI plays a large part in their shopping experience and those with the credit um, and those who want to enjoy uh, those products need to have those credit available to them. Um, there is almost like four or five X difference uh, in the number of transactions people do um, at the lower end uh, of the price point versus the higher end of the price point. Let's look at some of the other statistics. How does uh, does it um, um, how does it help uh, on the overall retail platform? It obviously uh, enable better conversion, having EMI um, or having credit seamlessly available for the transaction at uh, at the platform. Um, it also is a higher net spend. The customers spend almost 
uh, uh, 1.2x uh, yeah, almost 2x, uh, more than the customers who do not have credit available to them. So it means um, they in also can enjoy a lot more products or a lot more higher quality products. Um, they can, they are, um, they transact a lot more. They transact almost one and a half times more than the usual customer. And the cancellations are out. And the best part is the churn is low. If there are more people, uh, if there are 100 people leaving um, at the end of the year, uh, leaving the platform, there are only 40% lower churn um, during um, those who use credit on the platform or for those credit uh, transaction or there's a credit transaction easily done can can they do using credit on the platform so now since we established um, what it means for the e-commerce we would like all of our customers to really have credit isn't it but is that true let's look at the indian landscape and then uh, see how how it is fans out there are close to around about 700 million people in india uh, adult population i'm talking about um, largely 700 census based data um, how many online shoppers? They are close to around about um, last year, as per Bain, there were like 105 million online shoppers uh, who transacted um, on uh, in year 20, uh, 1920. How many have access to credit? Just 50 million. Um, that's true. Uh, only a 50 million of Indian adult population has uh, access to credit and that 50 million how many of them overlap with 105 million we really don't know but we hope it will be a large percentage of that uh, let me just walk you through uh, some of the numbers credit card um, credit cards are um, there are close to around about 50 55 million credit card in india today uh, available to only 25 to 35 million people so most of the people have two credit cards. So think about it, you have credit card available, available only to 25, 30 million people versus the population, adult population of 700 million. You see the gap? Then um, banks started working again. Um, they started working on something like DCMI. DCMI is nothing. It's kind of a um, nothing more than a pre-approved consumer durable loan by banks. Um, basically, when you are at a retailer, it can be enabled by swapping a debit card because they need to authorize your uh, authenticate and authorize your account. So um, we looked at what what proportion of the banking customer. While well, there are close to around about um, 800 million uh, debit cards in India, 708 to 800 million debit cards in India, but only 20 million have access to easy credit. Um, then we looked at what are the other players uh, who are working towards uh, enabling this. Um, there are players like Bajaj Finsa. If you really look at it, there's, there's one company I would really like you guys to go back and uh, look up again when you go back home. Um, that guys, uh, those guys have done really wonders in last uh, uh, 10 years, They uh, since 2007 in the credit finance space. Uh, pretty much um, uh, 14 to 15 million people, uh, customers they've brought in. They have also other, and that's primarily people who do not really have as much as credit available from the banks. Um, then there are a lot of fintech players. There are a lot of like just money is there, are, um, uh, uh, pay laters of the world. If you look at all of that, all of that put together is still just about 50 million. So then we looked at it. Um, so uh, quickly to recap or summarize, um, credit really aid commerce, especially beyond a plus point. If you really want to aid commerce on your platform and make customer available quality products, make customer have enjoy those products, you need to have uh, um, um, credit available on you, uh, on your platform. The customer have should have coverage to the um, credit, but is it there? Very limited credit coverage among Indian population um, today. So. Um, that, that's the truth. We looked at the data. Now, what we will look into is primarily we'll look into um, how traditional lending has been. And when I talk about traditional lending, let's go back a few uh, 10, 20 years uh, back, how it has been happening. Um, largely, uh, I think we, I will not really spend too much time here. We all pretty much know about this space well. Um, 
you have financial institute in the middle, which is uh, depicted in the blue, uh, which is, I uh, could be a bank or an NBFC, NBFC like a Bajaj Fin, banks like HDFC, ICA, SBI, PSU banks, and so on and so forth. Um, a customer applies for a data in case of a credit card or in case of a, a pre-approved um, uh, loans, the, um, sorry, in case of any personal loan, the customer apply for the data, they kind of give their application data, they give the personal information, they give the income data. And um, what does the financial institute do? They look up something like, a, there's something called Bureau, um, which is called Sybil, Equifax, Experian, there's one more, I, I, I missed the name. Um, so there are four of the uh, bureaus, all regulated, RBI governed. Um, they provide something like a credit score, credit performance, the bank uh, um, use something like an underwriting process for uh, underwriting a customer, give back the loan to the customer based on this, uh, customer keep paying the equated monthly EMI or um, um, pay the loan back in, um, in some form and shape, that information goes back and that goes back to the bureau. Um, but if there's no credit score, then what happens? Unless it is a collateralized loan, for example, if you are taking something like a home loan, where the NBFC or a um, bank can always have assets to recover the money from, uh, in an uncollateralized world, it is it's all the more so difficult. So let me uh, let let's we will dig deep uh, dig deep a little bit into the underwriting process next um, and so on and so forth, and we will see uh, what are the challenges with the bureaus. Uh, and um, so on and so forth. So uh, how, what is underwriting process? Um, basically individual credit worthiness, we, um, they try to establish that yes, if I give loan to a person or a company, and largely we are talking about a person here, uh, whether they will run away with money or they will not, they will give me my money back. And um, a typical industry framework is 3C framework, is like look at condition, character, capacity, character, is that guy has intent to pay capacity? Does he have um, the income to pay back me? Condition, uh, does, he, uh, does he have an even income? And does he work in an industry which is you know, very, very dynamic to the uh, changes? Or does he have, uh, is it self-employed where the, uh, the income could be, you know, uh, um, there's no guarantee to the income and so on and so forth. So those are the conditions. So that is what they try to establish over there. And then there's something like a portfolio management will not really delve into it. That's purely the bank process. I don't want to kind of um, give loan to too many low risk guy or high risk guy. It, it has to be a portfolio. There's some from high risk, some from low risk. So I make my margin, I make my money over there. But let's quickly, I will delve a little more deeper into how, the, how these banks solve for the 3C, which is character, capacity, condition. Um, character, they, they look at this, score, they look at the score from Sybil or some other bureaus and then kind of, um, and that's, that's what established the character. This guy has been paying uh, money from the past. So it means he has a character. He, um, he will, I trust him, I'll pay him, he will back. Capacity, we all know, uh, income, cash flow, assets, liability, what, how does it look like for him? Um, condition, I won't go into uh, much. Uh, but, but is bureau great in all the scenarios or not? It, um, it does serve a lot of purpose um, and it has evolved. So Bureau didn't exist before 2000. Yeah, before 2000. 2000 is when the civil was organized. So there's a lot of difference since the 2000 because the Bureau came into picture, but does Bureau suffer from um, um, any challenges? And let, let's quickly look at what Bureau looks into. Bureau looks into when they give a score to an individual, they look at four things, correct? I don't know, you are able to read the slide, it's, um, but I'll read out to you. Was first one is payment history. Um, do you have a history of paying back? High credit utilization, if you have already are assigned a credit of six lakhs and you are already using a credit of five lakhs, then you have already using quite a credit. Um, multiple inquiries means you really need money. Um, and then um, you keep inquiring through different banks and financial institutes. And then credit misc, a mix, of what kind of collateral, uncollateral, all of that plays a role in terms of defining what character you are for the bureaus. Um, so let's look at it. And this is from the Sybil. Um, the uh, Sybil has this um, um, beautiful chart out there. Um, what are the challenges? Well, if I don't have um, any data, if I had a, I don't have any history. 
B, um, I even if I have taken a loan in the past, it might not be the latest. I might have taken a loan two years back. So the recency is such a big problem with the bureaus because you, you don't really just um, uh, keep taking loan or keep uh, running the loan all the time unless you're a credit card user. And the credit card user we saw is like only the 27 million or 30 million um, which really exists in India today. Availability of new to credit data. So if you are new to credit means you have never taken a loan, um, there's no data with Bureau. The Bureau cannot really help bank and financial institute to come uh, come up with an algorithm or with a, um, you know, uh, with a risk model which can really help them make a decision on a person. Uh, quality of the data, bureaus always depend on other institutes' data. They are not the source of the truth. The source of the truth is uh, another. So they really don't know the quality of the data which is coming to them. Uh, there could be challenges with that. Uh, data reporting lags. Uh, most of these financial institutes are mandated to report only at a quarter. Uh, so suppose I apply for a loan today, my earliest data most likely will be available a quarter back in the uh, in the bureau. Now many of the banks have started um, putting in the data um, as late as um, you know monthly, but it's still uh, most of the majority of the reporting is still remained at a quarter. Um, so those were the challenges we looked at it. Uh, we looked at it the bureau. Um, why can't the bureau solve all the problems and uh, can a financial institute um, can we have worked with the financial institutes who kind of use the bureau data itself to underwrite these customers. Um, bureau has good amount of data. Bureau has about about 300 million uh, customers data. Um, but uh, out of that 150 million, um, the data is really insufficient. Um, they and around about 400 million uh, are new to credit customers and about 200, 200, uh, 200 million, uh, they have a good amount of data, but they sometimes suffer from recency. So as we see, there's a significant opportunity to supplement the Euro, uh, Bureau data. Uh, data insufficiency is the biggest, biggest problem. And how do we underwrite a uh, new to credit um, in, how does the financial institute underwrite in a new to credit category when there's no history available? Um, so quick recap of where we, uh, where we are, we, we, we've looked at the first two points, credit aid commerce, limited credit coverage among Indian population, a big new to credit segment who have never been given uh, credit before. And uh, Bureau suffers from recency of the data because there's only 27 million regular usage uh, credit card customers. So that's the only customers they have the regular information about when they take monthly uh, purchases. But beyond that, the regular recency is only for those who are serving any of the existing collateralized loan like home loan, auto loan or something like that. Um, moving on to uh, probably new age lending. How? Uh, let's look at what's happening around the world um, and uh, um, what trans um, actually inspired us um, over there. Um, we looked at two uh, companies who have been doing um, big time into it. One is FICO. Uh, FICO is um, an American company. FICO credit score is is like a gold standard in uh, in America. And um, then we looked at, um, so what they looked into, very similar to what Sybil does. Uh, payment history, debut utilization, file age, how long, how much data they have, vintage primarily, credit mix. Um, CSMA score, um, and this is, CSMA score is the score come, um, which Alibaba has, uh, Alibaba, Alibaba has come up with. And if you look at it, they, not, they do look at credits, not that they ignore the credit history, they look at the credit history, um, they look at the behavior preference. Um, how are you shopping online? Because that you will be doing regularly. Uh, how is your bill payment? Are you paying bill regularly? Your electricity bill, your Metelco bill, uh, your um, any other bill? And is that consistency in your payment behavior? Is that consistency in your? Um, uh, is there a consistency in uh, you know uh, in the bill amount? Is there ups and downs? Because that is where you will start. Um, making changes first to if, if, if something changes in your lifestyle. Ability to honor an agreement, they have sellers, buyers on their platform, they know that how well they are honoring certain agreements um, in terms of the purchases, in terms of the deliveries and so on and so forth, personal information, social network. So this is the new age uh, way. Alipay uh, pretty much um, scores pretty much around about 700 million customers in China. Um, there are other companies like Tala, um, and they are primarily in um, Africa. 
Kenya, uh, Tanzania, largely those are the big bills, and then Philippines and Mexico, some part of it. Uh, they are like close to around about 4 million customers. They primarily look at the data from device because the device the person carry, which is the mobile device, has the latest amount of data. Um, then there are companies like uh, MoneyTap, ZestMoney in India, closer to home, um, who are also started looking at outside of uh, what's happening um, outside the bureau. They start looking at the, you know, the SMS data, the bureau data, location, and so on and so forth. Um, so then that's when we decided what, what we want to do. And that is when we came up with an approach. Why don't we start working with FI? Maybe the commerce data will be worth enough to help them assess um, the customers on Flipkart, uh, confidently assess them uh, within the bounded NPA range, give them a real time credit uh, information. Um, and that is what we did. We worked with the financial institute largely uh, looking at existing to credit profile. So people who are using credit profile, we started working building their profile um, and started building models along with the insights and models along with the financial institutes um, to see how many more new to credit we can build a lookalike profile. And um, we assess them, give them the access, keep expanding the cohort. That's what we did. Uh, we start looking at then their payment industry start coming in. We start again um, uh, looking at um, um, more and more, you know, expanding the cohort from our side, um, and then uh, looking at what uh, behavioral patterns are aiding to it. So we identified n number of behavioral patterns, and I'll be touching upon that. I have a, a quick slide on that too, um, where we will talk about what behavioral pattern we saw kind of help us make this uh, profile look alike uh, to solve for. Um, but this is some of the you know performance metrics. If you look at the model, which uh, we come up with uh, the financial institute, uh, with the insights from the e-commerce, and then working closely with uh, with them, it's almost. If you look at it, we are able to improve uh, uh, 4x, um, almost 3.8x improvement in the pre pre-approved customer base um, for, for with the financial institutes. This is purely and purely uh, you know e-com data supplementing all of the data the financial institute could get from the bureaus and the non-bureaus and so on and so forth. Um, and a very consistent NPA. And this NPA is like, um, if you look at it, it's like flat line, uh, while the number of customers are growing, um, continuous increase in COD capture rate. And why we, uh, why we talk about COD capture rate? Because these are the customers who are largely new to credit. Uh, they use only cash and delivery at our platform. So we know that they, are, they do not really have as much, uh, as far as our understanding, they do not really have as much credit available to them. Um, all of this is aided by the behavioral patterns and um, we'll go through um, you know, in detail about what behavioral patterns really helped us achieve this. Um, model, some of the model performance, continuously improving portal performance from uh, you know, um, uh, the AUC is area under the curve of the model and that's, that's, that's pretty much how you define how well your model is performing over a period of time. Um, the max is one and reaching one is like a, a real gold mine. Um, typically you re, uh, a great score is from uh, starting from 0.72 to 0.76, uh, 78 types. Um, and uh, that is what we are aiming for. And we are, we are close to reaching over there um, in, in the next few months. This data is slide old data. We are uh, the, the latest models and everything which we have been working with financial institutes have been much better in, in these regards. Um, yeah, this one is an interesting line. And um, while we were doing the model, uh, uh, modeling with the financial institute and uh, through the insight generated from the econ data, we really don't know who is, um, especially uh, there are many customers whom we won't know they're existing to credit because they never use credit on our platform. Um, so uh, you see the bureau score, um, the NTC is new to credit customers, the customers who um, even bureau says that has never taken credit before. Um, and then bureau has multiple ranges, which is 300 to 800. They're divided into different buckets, subprime, near prime, prime, and super prime, which is 800 plus uh, typically. And then uh, on the left axis, um, uh, on the horizontal axis, you will see the scores, um, which we jointly developed with the, uh, the financial institute through our insights and data. And, um, uh, you know, um, the score of uh, uh, our model ranges from zero to one. And um, as you can see, um, the, it's, it's kind of a heat map. So 
Uh, the darker the shade, uh, we are able to do much better over there. So it's a lower NPA. Um, so even within the prime customer base, if you look at it, when um, the model says uh, between zero to 0 0.8, his NPA rate is, NPA is a non-performing asset or the default rate or delinquency rate, um, as we call it. Um, the default rate of a customer is much higher. While the bureau is saying that he is a great guy, he's a prime customer, um, but um, we, with the e-com data, with the latest and the recent information, we are able to kind of prove that, that even we are able to even split risk um, even over there and say that our, our rank risk over there, say that there are customers even in that bucket whom may not be really prime. And then if you look at the NTC, which is non uh, new to uh, credit, you will see those who are scoring um, 0.9 plus. Um, those are the customers, if you look at it, their default rate is almost equivalent to um, what you will find for the near prime customers or uh, you know the prime customers in the range of 0.9 plus. So very categorically, the additional data from e-com, some of the behavioral patterns which we can cover and solve, uh, which we could cover from the e-com data has really helped us um, better rank the risk, better split the risk for the financial institutes. Um, and let me just go through some of the uh, more uh, findings. These were the behavioral patterns I was talking about. We, we actually looked at the browsing data. We looked at the purchase um, history of the customer. We looked at the post-purchase engagement. And every time we kind of went into a specific category. And this, um, this pretty much um, is the, you know, the high level categories of those, um, high level categories of those behavioral patterns. Um, uh, if, you, if you go to the real data, there's like, um, there will be n number of data points against each one of them. So um, browsing, purchase, post-purchase, demographics, location base, uh, we could do very good. Um, um, the location is a great indicator on the default behavior for a customer. Um, so um, the reviews and ratings, how well he's engaged on and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, these behavioral patterns on our platform really help us see uh, what you see in the previous slide, basically split the risk much better than um, um, with the, um, in incremental to the bureau data. This is how we see it evolving in the future. You know, uh, we see that um, in the future, um, we will be working a lot more with the financial institutes um, in terms of building a complete customer profile um, and um, uh, covering up the personal characteristics, um, how their demo demographics are, how their financial um, information is. Um, very, um, there's another interesting um, um, model which uh, um, we were working closely with the financial institutes over there uh, with the data which we have on the platform. We were able to start predicting some kind of a, uh, you know, the income of a customer. Um, we have some um, sources through which uh, the customer declare income on our platform uh, while applying. So there are a number of customers while applying for a particular set of products, they declare the uh, they declare their income. And we kind of looked at that data and kind of start marrying it, um, a look -alike, build a lookalike profile for them. And we find that there's so much interesting patterns emerging out that. So we are able to start building out a lot more financial profile for a customer, both um, um, from multiple perspective. Um, you know, their immediate need, their uh, from financial uh, need perspective, uh, from their financial um, status perspective, from their financial, um, you know, propensity perspective that what uh, products they might be more keen to. Um, similarly, we are working on something like a demographics. Um, based on the demographics of the customer, the, the address, the, the information customer has supplied to the platform, uh, how well we are able to identify the location characteristics. Um, can we have a clustering effect uh, of, the, of, of, of a location? So for example, Koromangla. Within Koromangla, can we look at what all the clusters whom we can really, uh, you know, um, are, uh, will be at a de lower default rate because of the, you know, the, just because the location and the demographics of the location versus the uh, location characteristics, which may not really help us um, solve um, uh, the location characteristics, which may give us more insights that 
we can expect a higher default rate uh, in these places. So that's, that's some of the examples of um, then um, going forward, some of the social capabilities, um, macroeconomic indicators, industry plays a larger role. So uh, let's take post COVID and uh, example, the hospitality industry, which is going through very tough times. Um, uh, so having those information on the macroeconomic conditions uh, about a user or in general about the economy, uh, really help us, um, uh, you know, that's how we, we are thinking of evolving this, um, taking a lot more from the context um, where the user is coming from, um, which channel, which merchant, transactions, and then come up with the, you know, the recommendation uh, about a product affinity, what are the credit worthiness of the individual, capacity to pay, um, and what, what, what will be the best product terms um, based on the right portfolio mix for the, indi uh, for the individual. So uh, coming to the larger summary around the um, entire thing which we went through, um, just to recap everything, um, we saw credit uh, really aid to the commerce, especially uh, beyond a price point, uh, very limited credit coverage among Indian populations. Um, there's a huge new to credit segment um, where FI cannot, uh, cannot just rely uh, basically uh, mainly from bureaus. Um, then there is, uh, you know, the recency of the data, um, which also uh, the bureau suffers from. Um, and then, um, so what we have seen today is uh, how an alternate data can really, and uh, one means, and just one data point, uh, one all source of alternate data like commerce data can really be pivotal in solving something like, a, you know, the credit coverage in India to help enable uh, credit access to um, many, um, many deserving um, individuals out there um, in uh, across uh, the pan India, and then also, um, and um, the the reason why we brought this up also is basically to also kind of push you to think about the data which you have um, in the uh, play spaces which you are working on and identify the um, and uh, look at the various alternatives or the complementary uh, usage of that, which can really help you uh, probably bring a complementary um, uh, um, value add to something than your core space, uh, what you are working on. So that's why we thought we'll probably walk you through this um, example of uh, how alternate data is kind of changing the landscape in, consum in consumer lending. That's it from my side, Amanda. Awesome. Thank you so much, Saurabh, for sharing all those interesting insights with us, and especially with all your graphs and pie charts that were really helpful. So thank you so much. Uh, folks, if you have questions specific for Saurabh and for the talk that he just gave, please feel free to use the Q&A tab on the bottom of your screens. We have received some questions, but they seem to be for some of the previous sessions. So if you have something specific for Saurabh, please ask your question now. I think we got one, so I'm just going to quickly check. So, uh, Saurabh, I think this is a generic question, but uh, if you can answer it. So, someone saying, as a techie, where can I find uh, such information to learn from? I think uh, this person is just trying to figure out if there's like a community where, uh, you know, techies can be a part of and get um, information in general. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, um, it, it depends on what kind of information you are looking for. Um, the internet is, uh, you know, the sea of information today. It's, it, it's, it's like um, uh, the kind of information you are looking for, the number of blogs uh, which are out there, the number of, um, you know, the, uh, the magazines, the online magazines, um, very, very curated content um, out there. There's a lot of this um, um, many uh, companies opens about their technology. Um, for example, some of, um, uh, I, I keep looking at um, some of the blogs from Netflix and so on and so forth if I want to go deep into some of the tech stacks. Um, so uh, there are all this Reddit and all of those places you can really go into and then um, share, there's a lot of people who share a, a very similar interest and depending on your interest, you can probably subscribe to some of those feeds, can really help you uh, form um, knowledge about the areas which you are looking for, even share your knowledge um, about um, in those places uh, to the rest of the community. 
Thank you. So uh, we have a question from Gayatri. Um, maybe you can answer it. Maybe somebody else on the panel can answer as well. How does Flipkart ensure tech stack processes standards involved across the board, like for Flipkart grocery platform or for Flipkart video platform or the Flipkart e-commerce platform in general? Yeah, I'll, I'll probably take a stab and um, uh, anybody else who would like to probably uh, take a stab. So uh, basically we pretty much have, um, on, so Flipkart uh, uh, has two spec, um, is on both the sides of the spectrums. While it gives a lot more um, freedom uh, to the teams to come up with, uh, you know, the tech stack specific to solve a problem. So when we were solving, for example, this lending problem along with the uh, financial institutes, uh, we were given a freedom to kind of identify what tech stack suits us the best. So that kind of freedom is there. Um, and um, because the team which is there knows the problem uh, very well, they are closer to the problem so they can identify the right tech stack to solve for. Then there is an architectural review board. Uh, we have something like an ARB, uh, which we call as where all the architects, um, senior architects of the company comes together. Um, any major architectural decisions or the tech stacks decisions, you generally go to the architectural review board to get it reviewed and they kind of give you and help you with the uh, right decision making, the right framework, identifying both, both um, identifying the right non-functional characteristics of the systems, reviewing that you have done uh, enough justice to non those non-functional uh, characteristics uh, correctly. And then is the tech stack um, evaluated from all those perspectives? Um, and um, then, you, then you are on your own. You kind of, uh, once you are through with the ARB, um, then you kind of work um, making that tech stack, um, adopt the tech stack and work towards solving for it. Thank you. Um, uh, sort of Priyanka would like to know, is Flipkart looking at using this alternate data only for serving internal customers or to tie up with other financial institutions and be a data source? So uh, largely we are always tied up with financial institutes. Uh, ultimately the financial decisions lies with the financial institutes, it's not lies with the Flipkart. Flipkart is not a financial institute. Um, within the gambit of regulate, regulations, uh, we cannot make any underwriting decisions. All the underwriting decisions are made by the financial institutes. So we work closely with the financial institutes even on our platform. Uh, we started with our uh, with our platform. What we are looking at is basically uh, building this out uh, with the financial institutes, uh, largely for uh, the customers we have, and we have a large base of customers to start with. Um, so I think to, um, that is what we are looking at it uh, to uh, start with. We haven't given as much thought of just exposing that as a data source to outside of Flipkart or outside of the immediate ecosystem or financial institute we are working with as of now. Awesome. Uh, next question. Did the credit score model need change to adapt to the COVID situation? Absolutely. Bang on question. I think uh, that's, that's right to the um, uh, very apt question. Um, see, the situation has changed dramatically on the ground. Um, if you realize, um, well, if you guys, all of us are reading newspapers, the unemployment rate, the kind of GDP growth rate we were expecting and all of that, the situation has gone uh, dramatically different. Uh, many of these informations may not be, you know, very seeped in into the credit uh, model which financial institute use or the insights which we use. So what we do is, uh, it's not about just our data and which kind of make this difference. Uh, we work with the financial institutes to gather other kind of sources of data, which helps them make those decisions much easier and um, uh, make those decisions much better. Um, so, for example, uh, some of the information which uh, uh, financial, um, uh, in, especially in this scenario, I was giving you the example of the hospitality industry. Uh, they are going through a really tough time. Um, the the um, and um, you know the financial institutes really look for such kind of information that uh, where the uh, where the per is the person employed, where the person is employed for, and so on and so forth. Uh, so some of those industry information, some of those characteristics, they really look forward to. So not only we supplement the data, and yes, the the model uh, we continuously work with them and kind of um, um, supply additional insights, whatever available from the platform from our side, but they also we also uh, look at working with them and kind of supplementing that information from outside. And then yes, all of that goes into an uh, revision of the uh, credit models. 
Uh, Saurabh, so not sure if you just covered this, but another similar question with the Indian economy taking a hit, how does Flipkart cope up in the fintech space? What are some of the immediate measures of that Flipkart has taken? Yes, so uh, the fintech, um, the Indian economy is, um, yes, will go through a tough time. Um, and I think um, there is, um, uh, there is going to be a challenge, uh, both uh, from individual perspective, from uh, uh, from individual perspective, as well as from an economy and in the larger macroeconomic conditions as well. Uh, what we have done is uh, we have actually re-looked at the risk policies. Uh, we looked at some of the other events uh, which might have affected some of the decisions in the past. Uh, uh, say, for example, um, how the people's bearing would have changed. Uh, when there was a flood in Kerala, for example, uh, I think it was last year or so, if I'm, uh, if I had got the date right, or maybe a year before. So when we looked at uh, when the people, uh, people from, uh, when people are uh, subjected to such cal calamities, uh, what was the change in general on the, on, on people's behavior um, on, on, on this side? So we are, we are looking at those kind of informations, uh, trying to look at those data points uh, to help us make better decisions, uh, uh, help our partners um, in the ecosystem on the financial institution side make better decisions based on those data. And um, that's how we have been working on. Um, the second thing is obviously the risk policies. Um, the risk policies which were more uh, growth oriented. Uh, we are looking at, uh, you know, a uh, bit conservative from those expect of it as well. Um, but those are the larger part of the strategy uh, decisions which we have taken. Awesome. Uh, how often do we review the score and is there a metric to measure the success? Absolutely. The, the, the key metric is the default rate. Um, how many, uh, you know, um, if you go back to the slide which I was showing you about uh, how well we are um, against the Bureau, it is based on the data that how many people have defaulted um, based, on, um, uh, to the, um, based on the Bureau score versus uh, the, the score which we have come up along with the financial institute. Um, how often we look at the score, I think that is uh, how often we revise the score. Actually, we are in, um, that, that's the beauty of the technology and the data company. We, we work with the financial institutes to kind of revive the score as early and as often as possible. Um, it could be even 15 days, it could be, uh, it could be a month. As long as, as soon as we have a new information, typically our frequency is around about a month, but um, given the current scenario and situation, we are looking, we are looking at revising it every 15 days. So uh, while uh, some of the other institutes um, in, in a traditional way, typically the logistic regression models and all of that, they used to take like six months to one year to revive, uh, or revise, sorry. Uh, we continuously look to revise our score and the model every two weeks to one month. And that is the process which you have set in place to kind of continuously evolve. Awesome. Thank you so much, Saurabh. That's all the questions we've received for your section. Thank you for being a part of Flipkart Inspired and once again for sharing all those insights and answering all our questions. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Saurabh, you can stop sharing your screen now. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, participants, we have received a few more questions for you all, but they seem to be a little more generic uh, and relevant to some of the previous sessions and the previous talk that we had today. So what we'll try and do is we'll see how best we can answer those questions and share them back with you. Um, before we let you go, I'm going to quickly launch a poll uh, for a sort of section. Do tell us what you thought about it uh, on your screens. Ten more seconds to go. Folks who haven't rated, please rate sort of session. And we are done. Thank you so much to everyone who voted. For all attendees, you can catch all the latest updates about Flipkart by following us on our social media channels. Search for Flipkart on LinkedIn and Life at Flipkart on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And stay up to date on everything that happens at Flipkart. 
And just like that, we have come to the end of today's session. It's been three hours of captivating discussions that we've had a chance to hear about from some of the most interesting technology constructs that make up the base for the Flipkart platform, right from Flipkart's fellow ecosystem and all the features and investments that go into building a leading e-commerce platform to all the fintech innovations that are helping establish Flipkart as a leader. We all know a whole lot more about how it all functions. We thank you for taking the time out and being with us today on this Saturday evening. Your questions, enthusiasm, participation in the quiz is what makes it really fulfilling for all of us. I would also like to take the time to thank all our speakers for sharing their insights with us. They've been instrumental in building out these key solutions that help us differentiate and succeed. We hope you had as much fun in today's session as much as we had hosting it for you. Before I let you go, and because we love this so much, I'm launching one last poll. And this is basically feedback for the overall Flipkart inspired event that you all participated in today. So one last poll for the day. On your screens now. We have two questions for you. We'd like you to know how much we'd like to know, sorry, how much you enjoyed today's Flipkart inspired event. Even though we did it virtually, we hope you had a lot of fun and you got a lot of insights from all of our speakers. And two, we'd love to know that if we host future virtual events, would you love to be a part of it? Do let us know. Just 10 more seconds and I'll close the poll. Awesome. Thank you so much for voting. As of this moment, you're now part of a very exclusive, inspired community, and we will keep being in touch with all of you. The details about our quiz winners, like I mentioned, and a short feedback form will be shared on your email IDs. Please be on the lookout for the same. Your response will help us make future similar events a much bigger success. On behalf of Team Inspired, all our speakers today and everyone at Flipkart, I wish you all a great weekend. Take care, everyone, and stay safe. Bye.